Hello and welcome. It's Carrie here along with Dr. Anthony Chafee. And today we're hoping to tackle some of the most common carnivore diet myths and arguments against it in the hopes of giving you a clear understanding, help you navigate these questions. Uh, a lot of times arguments that prevent people from ever starting carnivore, myself included. It was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make. I kind of went against everything I was ever told nutrition wise. I thought I was going to die of a heart attack. But I learned that uh, many of those fears I had were completely unfounded when I had the, the facts and I had the truth. And once I had that, I was able to completely transform my life. So the goal of today's video is to help share those truths and the facts and answer some of these more difficult uh, carnivore arguments. So before we start, I just wanted to sincerely thank Dr. Anthony Chafee for being so generous with his time and for sharing his truths about the carnivore diet, because uh, sincerely, I get choked up talking about this, but I never would have started carnivore if it wasn't for Dr. Chafee and the other good doctors out there sharing the truth and answering these hard questions. And I'm on day 118 now. It's completely changed my life. It's changed the life of my daughters, my wife, my mother, so many people in my family, but it's completely transformed my life. And I really honestly don't think I would have started if I didn't have doctors like Dr. Anthony Chafee sharing these truths and helping us overcome these arguments against carnivore, things that we've been told our entire life. So sincerely, thank you very much, Dr. Chafee. And if you wouldn't mind, could you please introduce yourself, even though he yeah, well, well, knows you already, but just in case. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, you're very welcome. I'm really glad that that my videos have, have helped and that I'm sure that everyone else is very happy about that as well. That's sort of why we've done this, you know, we've seen that this really has helped us. This has helped our families, this has helped our friends, this has helped our patients and the people around us. And it's something that we just really couldn't, you know, keep bottled up. We needed to tell as many people as we could so that they could, they could experience this as well and take back their health. So, um, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm an American medical doctor. I currently live in Australia and uh, I'm a neurosurgical uh, resident or registrar as they call it here. And I've been studying nutrition and how that's, you know, diet and nutrition, how that's affect health and chronic disease and athletic performance for around the last 25 years. And, uh, you know, at a university and postgraduate and professional level. And I've been applying that to myself and as, uh, as well as my patients. And I found that this is one of the strongest tools in preventative medicine and reversing all these chronic issues, which make up you know, what 90% of the illnesses that we treat now is as a mainstay of, of modern medicine, uh, which didn't exist. That just simply did not exist in anywhere near the numbers that we're seeing them now before the 20th century. So that's something that I really hope that we can get back to, that we can get back to uh, that level of chronic disease that we were seeing, you know, in the 1800s and before we had other problems, but we didn't have those problems. And, you know, a lot of those other problems that we would have had in the 1800s, we have the modern medicine that we do have would absolutely amply uh, cover those sorts of things very well. So as long as we can get rid of the the chronic disease, I think we'll be in very good stead. So that's what I'm trying to do with uh, the podcast and, and getting the word out. Thank you, Dr. Chafee. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carrie from Homestead Howe. I started carnivore 118 days ago. I was pretty fired up this morning. I weighed myself, Dr. Chafee, and I'm in the 160s club. I, uh, nice. When I started at my head, well, not when I started carnivore, but at my heaviest, I did a little bit of keto. I was 262. I am currently eight pounds shy of being down 100 pounds from my heaviest. Uh, but like I've said before, the weight loss is obviously great, but I've overcome clinical uh, depression, arthritis, IBS, sleep apnea. I don't snore anymore. I can honestly say these last 118 days have been the best days of my life. I feel like I'm living like in a natural state, like a proper state that humans should be living in. And I didn't know what that was before. So it's completely changed my life. It's my, my purpose and my mission in life now is to share this with other people on YouTube. And we're also, I'm putting together a carnivore diet documentary. And so if people want to participate in that, it's carnivoredietmovie.com. It's completely crowdfunded. I'm really fired up about this as well because we just purchased our cinema grade camera uh, that is required from Netflix and some of the big streaming services. You got to have a top of the line cinema grade camera. I have that now and it's 
due in only in large part because of uh, people generously donating. Uh, this is all being crowdfunded and I put a lot of my own money into it, but we've, we're already starting to film it and uh, generously, Dr. Chafee, I asked him on an earlier episode if he'd like to participate and he said yes, which is very exciting. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing this word with more people via, via the carnivore diet documentary. I guess the only other thing I wanted to say real quick was Dr. Chafee and I did a video like this. It was about one week ago and it's really resonating mm -hmm. with people. You did a heck of a job, Dr. Chafee. It was great. Uh, if people want to watch it, I left a link below. Anyone that's from my channel that isn't familiar with Dr. Chafee, I don't know what you've been doing, but I left a link <laughs> to his YouTube in my description below and his Instagram. And I highly encourage you to check out his, uh, his YouTube channel. It's just doing some amazing stuff over there. So the idea behind this video is uh, I had a lot of people submit on my community tab. I said, what are your biggest arguments against carnivore? What prevented you from starting carnivore? What do your friends, families, doctors say to you? And you're like, oh, geez, that, is, that makes me kind of scared about doing carnivore. And we've got some really good ones here. We had some good ones last week, but there's a lot that we missed. And then a lot of new ones came in. So I think we're going to start out with some of the more popular ones that people ask. And then please post a comment, put a big Q or question by it. And uh, I guess we're trying to focus a little bit more, maybe not not so much on carnivore questions, but if you have a specific argument or something that held you up from doing carnivore, if you could post that as a comment, that would be great. So here's the first one. Are you ready, Dr. Chafee, to jump into some of these carnivore diet myths? Yeah, sounds good. All right, here we go. The first one is, sure, you'll feel great on carnivore, eliminating processed junk until 10 years from now when your arteries are clogged and you die of a heart attack. <laughs> I've heard this one myself many times. Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, it's fair enough, right? You know, if, we, if we're if we're if we're going on the premise that saturated fat and, and cholesterol or dietary cholesterol uh, affect heart disease, then you know, certainly that should be something that you're worried about. Uh, I ter I certainly agree that you can have a, a a very big disparity in how you feel just getting rid of some of the worst things that you could eat and getting more towards what you should eat. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we are not herbivores you know, we're, we're not even really omnivores, you know, we, we require meat, we do not require plants at all, we can completely subsist and sustain on on meat alone. And, um, you know, so so how are we omnivores? Why do we why do we need to eat plants? We don't need to eat plants, we could eat plants. But you know, a lion could eat plants as well. Cats are obligate carnivores, and yet they can get up to 60% of their calories from carbohydrates. So does that make them omnivores just because they can uh, eat an, another, you know, source of food. No, I mean, they, they require meat and they do much better on meat. So do we, right. And so, you know, why would our evolved diet, why would our biologically appropriate diet, why would our design diet be something that that's just going to kill us in 10 years? That doesn't make any sense. And, you know, when you look at all of these different populations, you know, throughout antiquity, you know, they, you know, they, they were thriving, they weren't just surviving, they were thriving. You look at the fossil record before the agricultural rev revolution, people were on average, literally there was a line, you know, people, you know, archeologists can tell exactly when that, that changed, you know, agricultural revolution hit when people picked up agriculture, they shrank by five inches on average, their brains shrunk by 11% on average. Their teeth became crowded and screwed up and crooked. Their jaws were too small. Their wisdom teeth didn't come in. They had, you know, dental caries, cavities. They had bone deformities, growth abnormalities, shortened femurs, and uh, uh, signs of tuberculosis in their spine and other sorts of areas. And then these are all signs of malnutrition and poor health, right? Immediately after we had agriculture. So immediately after we started eating more plants because we're probably eating some plants before that. And then people said, Hey, you can plant this yourself. And Hey, we can just do this here. We don't need to go around looking for it. Um, so presumably those people were already eating some plants. Um, once they started eating a lot more plants, health suffered immensely. And, um, and that was, that was just, you know, that there's no GMOs, no pesticides or weird fertilizers or chemicals or anything. You can't blame all that. You know, it was just the plants themselves. And so, you know, that, that just doesn't even pass the smell test. You know, we had people living quite a long time. Oh, well, people only live to be 30 years old. That's not true. That's not true at all. That's average life expectancy from birth. First of all, you have no idea what people were living to in the ice age. How, how would you know? You know, I mean, like you have, you have fossil records 
and things like that. It's like, oh, well, they weren't all decrepit and broken and osteoporosis and, and having a bunch of arthritis. That means they, they didn't grow to old age. No, they just didn't get osteoporosis and arthritis. You know, what animal does? You know, what lion gets osteoporosis? What, who has their teeth fall out? What elephant gets, uh, you know, get, gets tooth decay and, and has all sorts of, you know, serious medical problems and has to go into, you know, an old folks home. Um, you know, they just, they just live, they live, they live, they live, and then they die. They, they're at, at quite good health, active elderly adults, um, until they just run out of time and they just sort of keel over at that point. They're not dying slowly over decades of chronic disease and illness. Right. And that, and look at animals in the zoo, right. They live longer than they do in the wild because their life isn't as rough. Right. And so, you know, but they don't, they, they're not getting all these chronic diseases. They're not getting, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's and, and, uh, having their teeth fall out and rot and their bones decay and all these sorts of things. None, none of that happens. None of that happens at all. We're the only animal species on earth apart from domesticated pets that are fed something they're not supposed to eat either. They get these sorts of chronic diseases and debilitation and degeneration as, as they age. So, um, you know, just right off the bat, we're like, you know, why would eating meat cause any of these problems, which never existed in the numbers they're eat they're found in now, previously when we've been eating this way. In the 1800s, we ate more meat on average than we do now. No heart disease. Hmm. Dr. Osler was the first professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins, one of the most famous medical professors ever, and teachers and authors. And you know, has I have his I have his textbook um, from the 1800s, late 1800s, um, that uh, was my my great grandfather's, and uh, when he was a doctor, probably a medical student, and you know, he had said like in his entire career, you know, spanning you know two decades before he became a professor, he said that he saw maybe six cases of angina, angina, depending on the part of the world you're in. And so that that's, you know, just painful ooh, sort of tightness, chest pain, not necessarily, you know, heart disease, but just that sort of chest pain, no heart attacks, never saw a heart attack, not one mm. in his entire career. Right. And that, and then in the 1920s, 1930s, all of a sudden heart disease is the number one killer in America. Right unheard of before that in uh you know 19 1910s or so 1910 or so was was the first case of an autopsy confirmed case of uh someone who died from a myocardial infarction from a clot in the heart blog clogging the arteries and died from that and uh confirmed on autopsy guy wrote it up and published it people didn't believe him they said that that's bullshit we've never seen that before you're making it up you know it's something else you're just you're just you know misinterpreting what you're seeing you know blood coagulates and congeals after they're dead that's what you're seeing something like that uh 10 years later there would be there was a, a number more of them and they're like oh okay they, they didn't take it seriously for a decade until they started seeing more and more of these and like oh okay that guy actually may not have been full of full of crap 10 years after that, it's the number one killer in America. What happened, right? Well, if you look at our meat consumption, meat consumption was going down actually. And it actually troughed right at the, when heart disease started really climbing up and became the number one killer in America. At the lowest point, we were eating the least amount of meat and heart disease started whoosh, spiking up exponentially. Unheard of a decade ago, now the number one killer, mm -hmm. right? And so in the 1800s, when you're looking at, there was actually quite a lot in the early 1800s, we we're actually eating a lot more meat, a lot more meat than we even do now, right? And basically the most amount of meat that we've eaten in the last 200 years was in the early 1800s. Slowly sort of came down, came down, came down. Absolutely no heart disease. None. You know, oh, they just didn't notice it. Bullshit. You know, you are, you are making uh, an assumption that is absolutely not borne out by the evidence that we had copious medical records. We have copious journal articles. You made your name by discovering a new disease. Like that guy who, who did the autopsy in you know, the early 1900s. It, he was the first one to do it. You know, that guy's name is, is always going to be, uh, you know, as the first person to describe that in America, right? Everyone was clamoring to show this stuff. This was just a major, major killer. You know, people were doing autopsies. People were doing dissections. They would have seen this. There are other sort of cardiac related death, not myocardial infarction, right? And so the idea that heart disease is, is caused by cholesterol and, and saturated fat, I mean, honestly, you don't even need to go in, get it, get even to that point 
will realize that like this is completely bullshit. How can an ancient diet cause a new disease? This is a new disease. We've always been eating that way. How is that? How is that the thing? It's something new that came in, like processed foods, seed oils, refined sugars, things like that. These ingredients that have never existed before. So, in fact, no. You know, you feel better because it's this is how we're designed to eat. Saturated fat does not cause heart disease. End of story. Dietary cholesterol doesn't even really contribute to uh, our, our serum cholesterol. You make most of it, right? And you only absorb what you need. Your body's very good at that. So, you know, if you, if you eat something that has a lot of cholesterol, you just don't absorb the cholesterol that your body doesn't want. I was very selective on that. And the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020, massive literature review looking at, you know, all the best, all the top studies, randomized control trials, uh, meta-analyses of, of various trials, looking at all the highest level evidence to do with saturated fat and heart disease. And they found that there was no association between saturated fat intake and heart disease, but they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat and stroke rate. So the more saturated fat people were eating, the lower their risk of stroke, which is you know, part of the cardiovascular disease complex, right? And the less saturated fat they're eating, the more uh, higher risk of stroke they had. Um, and there's tons of studies. There was a study, a uh, recent study that looked at nearly 12 million people one of the largest studies that's ever been done and found that the higher your LDL cholesterol, the longer you lived and the less likely you were uh, to die of all cause mortality, the lower your risk of all cause mortality was there's sort of a U shaped curve. So on the real, uh, as, as you got lower, actually more people died, your all, all cause mortality went up. And as you sort of went up, that went down. And then in the big extremes, of LDL cholesterol, it went up a little bit, but not that much. And what that could be is, you know, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. You know, these people have a slight increase in uh, in death, but that has been shown to not be because of the cholesterol level, but because that there are uh, some of these people, more of these than, than the rest of the population that have familial hypercholesterolemia that also have clotting disorders and are hypercoagulable. So they're more likely to clot. And that's what a heart attack is, right? You, may, you get a little bit of damage, clots off, and you, you block off the blood supply. Same with, with strokes, a lot of different strokes. There's different kinds of strokes. And so when you, when you pair those out and you separate out the ones who have that genetic abnormality and ones who just have hyper high cholesterol, the ones with super high cholesterol, no increased risk, none above a uh, baseline of the population. So that's likely what that is. You have these, this, this, uh, you know, group of people with familiar, you know, with congenitally massive cholesterol. Some of them are predisposed to clotting more. Some of those will die more. And, but it's not even not all that much more, you know, after you get abo above the age of uh, 50, it's even, you know? So, you know, this idea that, you know, it's just a ticking time bomb is uh, uh, nonsense. But you know, it's a fair question, though, you know, because that's something that we've been, you know, that we've been hammered with for decades now. But it's just it's just flat out untrue. And you know, I'll just end with this. Um, you know, this is not just untrue. This was this was not just false. It was fraudulent. The Journal of the American Medical Association published in 2016 actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in the 50s and 60s detailing how they're paying off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA and it was he who authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration stating that cholesterol uh, caused heart disease and uh, or at least was you know associated with it. And so that was the recommendation. Stop eating fat and cholesterol. Stop eating meat. Stop eating eggs. Start eating heart healthy, low fat grains, uh, vegetables, fruits. And uh, well, you know, what are we going to do? You know, this, this is a large portion of our dietary calories or caloric intake uh, was from fat, from animal fats. And so they said, OK, well, just replace that with sugar then. Sign sugar and seed oils. So sugar and seed oils went up dramatically. The amount of, of um, seed oils that we consumed in America from the 1970s, and this is this is um, Pew um, Pew Institute research, 
they showed that and using USDA numbers showed that they over tripled the amount of, uh, well, we over tripled the amount of seed oils that we consumed since the 1970s to today and over tripled the amount of high fructose corn syrup from the 1970s to today. Now we slightly came off on cane sugar that went down a bit, but we replaced it. And then a lot more with high fructose corn syrup. So the amount of sugar that we ate, you know, went up quite a lot. It sort of petered out and sort of come down a bit, uh, in recent decades, but it, it did go up significantly from the 1970s and it's, and the seed oils are still on the rise. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that is much more likely to be what's indicated here. You know, something that we are eating more of and have never eaten before, have never been anywhere, in, it has just not been in nature, didn't exist before that. That this is this is a new construct. These seed oils are manufactured. They're brand new. You know, some of these didn't, didn't exist before the 50s. Some of them are even more recent than that. And so, you know, why would why would something that we've always been eating and have been eating more of previously not caused the disease that we're seeing now, if that were the cause. Right. Well, yeah, I think we talked about this in the last episode, but it's like, if you want to sell an incredible amount of sugar, it's really easy. Just demonize meat. So a lot of mm -hmm. the things I've heard over the years, I, I never really thought about that before. You know, one other thing, Dr. Chafee, you mentioned uh, just now, and you mentioned a little bit before, and it really resonated with people, was sort of the natural state of animals. Uh, I had a bunch of family over yesterday, and my well, one particular person, he has like the skin condition. His skin was like falling off his arm, overweight, mm. fatigued. I just, I really felt for him because he had a lot of issues that I had before. And so I used your sort of analogy, and I was like, we have a lot of deer by our property. I'm like, imagine if you saw a, a family of deer over there and their fur was coming off their arms and they had big bags under their eyes and they, their belly was touching the ground and they had big flaps under their, their legs. You would drive by and you saw a whole family of deer like that. You would be like, Oh my goodness, what's wrong with them? They're sick. They're so sick. It's sad. Like they, we should, uh, we should do something about that. But then you go to the grocery store. It's like every human looks like that and it just becomes our new normal. Like, Oh, that's just for taking, but that's not, that's not the natural state of an animal. It's not the natural state of what a, a human should feel like. I think that's one, yeah. one thing that's tough about being a human and kind of uh, overcoming some of these carnivore arguments is we're so set in our current time and things just slowly become normal. But some of the things you're referencing from 1800s and stuff like that, if you look back, it's really abnormal what we're doing right now. People keep telling me carnivore diet. Oh, that's a fad diet. And I'm like, no, the way people are eating now is a fad diet when you compare it to all time of what people have been eating. So, well, I'm, well, we'll look at the definition of a fad diet, right? Fad diet is, you know, it's highly restrictive. You're cutting out major food groups, something that's just sort of, sort of flash in the pan. It's not going to be there because it's, it's, it's not healthy, right? It's not, it's not, it's not something that can be perpetuated, right? Uh, no one says that about a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet and you cut out meat, something we've been eating forever. You know, it's, it's, it's it has never been argued in any serious format that humans are anything but apex predators, right? Top of the food chain. Now, some of these, you know, strange people are saying like, oh, no, 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 actually, you know, we're, we're vegans. We're just like orangutans. We're frugivores. And we're like, no, that's not what we are. And, and no serious biologist, zoologist, or, you know, anthropologist or paleoanthropologist or any, any evolutionary biologist has ever, ever said that in any serious context. I've never heard that ever. And, you know, speaking with, you know, uh, people like, you know, Dr. Mickey Ben Dorn and, uh, you know, Professor Bill Schindler, uh, who are, you know, PhDs. And uh, uh, Bill Schindler was a, you know, a now retired professor of paleoanthropology and archaeology at the University of Maryland. No one is is arguing that we were vegan, <laughs> that we were vegetarians and, and frugivores and things like that. No one, no one at all. And so it's, this, this is just, this is just propaganda really. So, you know, what is a fad diet? Okay. Something that's, that's very restrictive. You're cutting out whole food groups, all that sort of stuff. Okay. So no one's saying that about a vegetarian diet. They're saying, oh, that's great. It's going to save the planet. It's so good for you. Well, no, no, it's not none. Note all of those. And why is that not a fad diet? And, and what is fad like of 
eating what we're designed to eat biologically? How is that a fad diet? How is that a flash in the pan? How is that something that's just come out of nowhere? That's what we've been eating always. You know, that's, that's the norm. Eating vegetables is new, very new, in fact. Really wasn't doing, we really weren't doing it in much, in large amounts since before about 8,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution, the earliest example of agriculture. And so before that, you know, maybe some gathering, things like that. But predominantly when we had megafauna, access to megafauna, we just ate, we just ate meat. And so maybe we knew which plants to eat, but we ate meat. So how is that a fad? How is what we were designed to eat a fad? And, you know, cutting out food groups, who's cutting out food groups? I'm eating what we're designed to eat. That is food. Food is species specific, right? A food to oh, well, look at, look at, look at koalas. They're only eating eucalyptus. They're cutting out entire food groups. That's a fad. Eucalyptus is a fad, right? Um, that's ridiculous, right? Animals eat very specific things in the wild. We don't, and we are suffering for it. And this is why you have signs that, you know, nature preserves and zoos and parks to say, do not feed the animals. They need to eat a specific diet. They get very sick if they eat outside of that. We do too. And we get the same things they do. They get all these chronic diseases. And you ask a zookeeper, like, hey, would you give them kibble? You give them dog food? You give them all this stuff? And they just look at you in horror. Like, God, no, you give animals that they'll get human diseases. Hmm. How, what do you mean? They're catching it from us? No, they're getting it from the food. The food is causing the harm and we're eating that stupid food too. You eat outside of your species specific diet, you're going to get problems. Your body's going to break down in ways that, that, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't expect and wouldn't want. So how is that a fad? How is eating the only thing that is verifiable? food to our species, the only perfect food to our species. How is that a fad? That doesn't make any damn sense. That there's someone who doesn't know uh, what they're talking about, really. Right. All right. Here we go with another one. I'd love to do carnivore, but who the heck can afford steak or meat? I'm not rich. I've had this comment many times. What normal person can afford to buy steak every day? Well, you don't need to, to buy steak every day. Ground beef is really cheap. Chicken's cheap. Eggs are cheap. Uh, well, uh, they used to be anyway. I don't know. <laughs> they come back down. I think there's <laughs> there like all those memes about like, you know, like buying, you know, like houses with, you know, rack of eggs or something like that. But um, no, there, there, there are cheaper options. I mean, you don't have to, it's not a, it's not a ribeye diet. It's a, it's a meat diet, right? So ground beef is very cheap. And in fact, if you, if you look and compare per pound. Uh, steak is actually cheaper per pound than spinach or lettuce. You know, these, these things are, are not inexpensive and they weigh nothing. You know, you get a head of lettuce, it weighs two ounces and it's five bucks, right? Hmm. Okay. We'll do that another eight times and see where you're at. And, and then look at the steak and tell me it's expensive, right? right. And in the steak, you are getting perfect nutrition that you can, that, that will feed you for 24 hours right? What the hell is eight heads of lettuce going to do for you? Right? Not much. So it actually is when you, when you break it down, you actually look at it, you know, I mean like, you know, pasta, you know, you know, rice and things like that. Sure. That that's very cheap. You know, that's very cheap per pound, but you're not getting all the nutrients you need. It's not optimal nutrition and you're, you know, you're going to suffer as a result. And you know, what's your health worth? What's your life worth? What are your medical bills worth? What are your medications worth? You know, you, you can get off of your medications. You can get healthy. You can have a new lease on life. You have mental health, mental uh, clarity, uh, physical health. You'll be able to do things you weren't able to do before. You'll be able to, to work harder, work better, be more productive and earn more money, be better in school. Your kids will develop better. They'll, they'll be more successful or at least have the potential to be more successful in their endeavors. And, you know, you really can't put a price on that. You know, it's like that, that it costs nothing compared to the alternatives and compared to feeling sick and feeling miserable and wretched. So, you know, you, you, you in fact spend less and you're not doing all the snacks. You're not doing all the oh, Starbucks and the, you know, three meals a day and three snacks a day. I eat once I eat a big steak. I'm done for 24 hours. You want to do that with ground beef. That's fine. You know, three ninety nine a pound. I eat two pounds a day. That's it, right? Eight bucks. I'm out the door. What did you spend on Starbucks yesterday, right? 
I'm, I, I'm, I'm, and that's perfect nutrition for 24 hours. So in fact, if you break it down, you know, uh, it's actually cheaper just with the food, but also you will save so much money and earn more money in the long run than, than you ever will eating any other way. Yeah. You said it, you can't put a price on it. I, I kind of mentioned that in my 30 day update video, but if someone were to say, Hey, you can have a billion dollars right now and never know about carnivore. People are like, Oh, that's BS. You're full of it. I wouldn't take it. I would rather do carnivore. I had, my life was so horrible before and it's mm -hmm. so much drastically better now. I guess the only other thing I wanted to mention too is the lettuce and the spinach too. All that stuff gets wasted so much as well. And it people does. don't account for that price. You buy a head of lettuce mm -hmm. and then it goes bad in the fridge and you throw half of it out. Well, now you just basically paid twice the amount for that lettuce that you didn't even eat half of. So, mm. Yeah, and it was oh. gross anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. never ate it. I'm like, oh, I feel great now. Not that yeah. me up. I'm doing the same thing yeah. as you, by the way. Lion diet for 30 days, one big steak. The, the energy, I, it's unbelievable. I was, I, we had a bunch of people over yesterday and they're like, you just eat one time? I was like, yeah, 23 hours. I'm not eating anything. And they're like, you have all this energy. I've just, I've just been going nonstop. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's. And, and time, you have so much time, you know, you know, I, I, I figure that I probably have another six hours where I'm not thinking about preparing or eating food. You are just, a testament. You, you are a testament to the time. I can't imagine your schedule. You're yeah. doing neurosurgery. You're helping people with nutrition and carnivore diet. You've been doing interviews and Q and A's. You've been so generous with your time, but you, that's what I, that's why I, your channel, I think, resonates with a lot of people because you're speaking the truth, but you're practicing what you preach. And I was like, it's amazing that we're, we're talking right now with the schedule that you keep doing neurosurgery and then all of this on top of it. So much extra well, time. Well, you know, it, it, I would not be able to do this if I wasn't, I wasn't doing carnivore. You know, neurosurgeries, you know, I'm, I'm um, extraordinarily busy with that. Um, at, at the moment, um, I have a bit lighter schedule. Uh, so that's, that's great, but it's still busy. I'm still, you know, uh, I still fill up all my time, all my, my free time that I'm not in, in the hospital or in, in my clinic, uh, with, with other sort of projects. But, you know, when I'm, when I am really ramping up, I mean, sometimes you, you can go anywhere from, you know, 90 hours a week to 135. That was the longest I've done was 135 hours in a week. And obviously that's, that's the whole week and then you're into Wait, the next all week that, let me do the math quick i think that's like the whole week yeah. <laughs> well that was the thing was I, I did um i did two on calls during the week and then and then 48 hour shift over the weekend and into the monday worked a 14 hour shift so it was 62 hours straight you know and uh and that was the thing i, I was working basically every single day and um you know at the hospital and and so you know you're at least six days a week and then if you're on call the whole weekend, it's always busy as hell. You know, it's um, if, if nothing else, you're just you're just getting hammered with phone calls. But quite often you're going in doing multiple visits to see patients at, you know, one or many hospitals and and possibly doing surgery all night and the next day. And then, you know, rounding on 60 patients and, uh, you know, trying to see everyone, you don't have a team, you normally have, you know, 10 people throughout the week, all doing things. It's just you and, and one other guy who's there till noon. <laughs> and then it's just you and, you know, and it's very busy, you know, and it'd be a lot of very sick people and getting slammed with calls. And, you know, then in, in what little time I had outside of that, you know, I was, I was, you know, on the weekends that I wasn't on call working all the time, all, all the time I, I would, I would do um, some private work in, in, uh, clinics, trying to see people uh, in a functional medicine aspect and, uh, and try, you know, because I, I was able to talk to people about diet and lifestyle and, and improving their health and getting them off medications, as opposed to just damage control. You know, someone came in, they fell off a ladder and they cracked their head and they need, they just need surgery or they just have a big tumor or spinal injury or something like that. They just, they just need surgery. They need help. And so it, it was really nice. And so I was, you know, I was seven days a week every week. And then in the evenings, if I wasn't on call, I was doing this sort of stuff. So it was basically every waking hour of the day, you know, I'm doing stuff and, you know, it was fine. You know, I was, I was really enjoying it. It was hard. It was a lot of work. I was very tired most of the time, but it was extremely rewarding. And, you know, if it wasn't, wasn't worth it, I wouldn't have done it. But, you know, I, because I was doing a carnivore diet, it was, it was absolutely something that I could do. Uh, whereas like my intern year that hellish hours, I mean, I was doing hundred hours a week easily, you know, it was quite often doing 115, 120 hours a week, uh, you know, 
back to back week after week after week after week. And I hate it. It was the, the longest year of my life. You know, I've been in Australia now for four years. It's just flown by it's that fast. You know, it's, it's absolutely crazy how fast it's gone. Um, and so I absolutely would not have been able to do this if I wasn't eating this way. No chance in hell because I've done similar things when I wasn't on this, when I was 10 years younger and hated it. It was absolutely awful. That's the thing too. I, I, I've been telling people, I think it's true. I feel like I'm getting three times the amount of work done I was before, but I'm also mm. enjoying it too. My mood is great. It's not like, oh, this is a big challenge. So, all right, here's another mm. question. My trusted doctor disagrees with the carnivore diet and recommends eating healthier and in moderation. Wants me to start statins. Yeah. Well, look, you know, I mean, there's, there's no, you know, there, there's, there's, there's no, there's no main major issue with that. You know what I mean? Because, because that, that's what the doctor has been taught. This is very new information. It's actually very old information that we've known for freaking hundreds of years, thousands of years, but it was been papered over. And so this has been, you know, for the last 40 years, we've been told uh, to eat, you know, differently than we've always eaten our entire life, you know, and, and expect it to go back to how we've been, you know, throughout our existence before. It makes no sense, but you know, that, that's just what, what they're taught. They're taught that, you know, meat and fat are bad you know, fair enough. You can't really fault them for that. But you know, what you can do is you can just say, well, you know, um, this is something I want to do. I, I would like your help. I'd like you to work with me. You know, this is something I'm, I'm looking at and I actually think it, it would be healthy for me. And I think I do want to try this and uh, I would like your help with it. But if you know, you don't want to help me, that's fine. I'll do it on my own. You are the boss, you know, doctor works for you. Right. And so, you know, if they say, no, you, you can't do this and the other, like you can say no, <laughs> like it's, uh, it is your choice it is your body. You absolutely don't have to, to do anything. Um, you know, this is, this is the thing with, with medicine. We talk about compliance, you know, it's like, you want to recommend something for your patients. It's a matter of, you know, how do you convince them to get on your plan, you know, and, uh, and, and make them comply and do it because a lot of patients just be like, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to do that. I think that's dumb or it's not, it's not something that, that I want in my life. Um, so, you know, you can just tell them and just say, Hey, look, this is something that I've looked into a lot. I'd love, I'd love for you to take a look at this stuff too. And, uh, and this is something that's helping a lot of people around the world. This is probably something that could really help you and, and, and certainly help your patients. And, you know, maybe you should, should check it out. And, um, you know, if you know a lot about it, you can, you can try talking to them about it and just telling me about it. But at the end of the day, you can just say, Hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And I want to do this. I'd like your help, but if you don't want to help me, then, then don't help me. It's not a big deal. Or you don't even have to bring it up. I mean, I mean, how many times does your doctor ask you what your diet is? Never, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it just may not even ever come up, right? You just go about, you're doing, how's everything going? How's this going? Oh yeah, yeah. Everything's fine. Oh, okay. Hmm. All right. Well, you know, your blood pressure's a little up. Let's put you on this. Let's raise that. Let's do that. All right. See ya. That's what happens. You know, they only know that you're on a carnivore diet. If you tell them, you know, maybe if your cholesterol goes up, like, Oh Jesus, what are you eating? Like, mm, same thing. I don't know. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's, you know, they only know necessary. They only know what you tell them. And also it's, this is your, this is your choice. Um, I think it's very important to work with doctors and your doctor. And, but if they're not on board, that's okay. You know, they don't have to be on board. You know, doctors have plenty of patients who smoke and drink, right? That's not good for them. Doctors know it's not good for them. They don't say, Hey, I'm going to fire you as a patient. If you don't stop smoking and drinking, you know, they'd lose half their patients. Right. And so, you know, it's, um, you, you don't have to fall in line with their recommendations. If you don't agree with their recommendations, uh, eating healthier, well, you can just counter with that and be like, well, actually, you know, from what I can see, this is the healthiest way to eat. This is what our biologically our appropriate diet is. Uh, eat in moderation. What the hell does that mean? Eat what in moderation? Arsenic? You know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, that, that that doesn't make any sense. Eat what in moderation? Well, eat everything in moderation. Cat food? I mean, what, what the hell are you talking about? You know, what in moderation? And so, you know, the idea that you can just eat anything and meat, dirt in moderation, Coca-Cola in moderation, what the hell does that mean? You know, there's a fight right now between the WHO and the FDA because the WHO uh, defined aspartame as a, as a, uh, carcinogen and the, and the FDA, which is, you know, over 70% funded by, uh, pharmaceutical companies, which are heavily invested in the food companies say, no, you have to take that back. We don't agree with you. I wonder why, uh, not that WHO isn't compromised either because they are. And, you know, 
so so they're saying well you know the, these studies that they're looking at you know we don't really we have these problems with them and we think that you know it's still safe and wouldn't cause cancer if you drink it below a certain amount it's like okay well what below the you know the recommended daily limit well, what the hell is the recommended daily limit for aspartame who the hell knows that i've never heard that you know no one ever told me they didn't teach that in medical school you know it doesn't say that on the can on, on the back of a can of diet coke right so who the hell knows what that is you know when people are drinking diet coke i know i know people that drink diet sodas they drink like 20 30 of these things a day right so that's probably over that. And then it's just like, oh, if they eat less than a certain amount, then it won't cause cancer. So after it, it does, like, I mean, what the hell? <laughs> you know, like, right. so this is poison. You're yeah. just saying, I ah, just don't have too much of the poison, right. you'll be fine. You Moderate know? Like, your poison oh, intake. That's a bad recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. And we we've done it too. Moderate the amount of, of poison you're intaking into your body. I was mm. one of the biggest things that happened to me in carnivore was stopping snoring where uh, and sleep apnea. I would stop breathing over and over again. In retrospect, I'm having these carnivore epiphanies, but it's like I was basically nearly dying multiple times a night because I was just poisoning myself with garbage food and sugar that was causing inflammation. And within a couple of days, it went away. But it's amazing how many people are, they're literally just kind of slowly poisoning themselves or consuming sugar and having inflammation. And they all these health issues and they just keep doing it. It's, it's crazy. All right, here's another question. The so-called blue zones where people tend to live the longest are generally not carnivore, but more plant-based diets. If you want to live to be 100, plant-based is the way to go. Well, so who, who says that they are plant-based? Some guy who wrote a, a paper and call and said so, you know, uh, that that's what it was. It, there's not a, there's not a study. Right. This, this was this was like an op ed, you know, uh, if, if 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 it was even that rigorous, you know, um, and they they looked at these areas, some of the areas, not all the areas, but some of the areas that that have uh, people that live uh, have quite a high life expectancy and a lot of uh, centenarians so people that live over 100 years and, you know, independent and healthy and moderately healthy. And they said, oh, well, look at them. They eat, they eat a lot of plants. Okay, well, first of all, the American diet, the standard American diet is already 70% 70, 70 plant-based, right? So, you know, it's it's actually the same. I mean, everyone's sort of plant-based now around the world. Um, and so if you look at Sardinia, you know, I mentioned my friend, uh, Dr. Bill Schindler. Um, he studies ancient cultures and societies and ways of eating and uh and, and stool stone tool making like he's he's you know uh, an international expert on making stone tools that we were using over the past two three million years and he can make them and recreate them you know he can go walk around find flint and you know make a knife and some arrowheads out of it like just on the spot right and he went to sardinia I was speaking to him about this i'm going to have him on my podcast next week or i'm going to interview him next week and then have it uh after that um, I, I was, you know, uh, Elle and I were going to try to go and meet him over on Sardinia. I really wish I was able to go, but I was having visa issues. And so he said that not only are so Sardinia is, is the first blue zone ever identified. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the blue zone study, it said, oh, they're, they're largely plant-based. Well, he went there and he lived with these people and he, and he, you know, studied them. And he said, not only are these guys not plant-based. They're almost exclusively whole animal based. They're like cooking up whole, you know, oxen on you know spits and things like that, or whole sheep and lambs on spits. And they're they're almost completely carnivore. They use like like plants as like garnish and seasoning and things like that. But they're just eating a ton of meat. That's the majority of what they're eating is fatty meat, and uh, and then some like locally grown wine, and that's it. And these people are extremely healthy. And, uh, you know, very happy, very family oriented sort of people. That's another thing too. Um, you know, in the outliers book by, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, he looked at a lot of these places too and why they live so long and that, well, maybe it's genetic and they go to these different areas and they have those populations come over to America and they're like, yeah, they don't have the same longevity. And what they, what they found, the difference was, is that, you know, back home in Europe where they, where this is sort of a, a blue zone, um, there's, there's a strong sense of family and community. You know, there's there's often three, even four generations 
of people living in the same household at all times, you know, and if not, their whole families, you know, just down the block, right? So it was that very, very tight knit unit and community. And, and he felt that that had a, had a large uh, thing to do with this. So then you look at the other uh, blue zone areas, they, they pick Loma Linda, uh, which they say is the you know, Seventh day Adventist. Uh, and Seventh day Adventist, they, they're all vegans, they're all plant based. That's not true. Some are. You know, not everyone are, I, are, but I, you know, I literally just spoke to uh, someone who's in the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, right now, and uh, and you know, grew up in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. His dad is is a um, you know member in good standing, and you know, you know, works with them, and uh, he was just like, yeah, we all eat meat. Everyone eats meat. There's maybe five percent of the Seventh Day Adventists who are like these crazy whack job hardcore vegans. You know, that's it. But that is what the church preaches they say you should be plant-based you should not eat meat but like everyone does you know and so um and uh, you know and, and a lot of these people are sick and they're overweight and they're unhappy and they're unhealthy and i've spoken to other ones they said that that you know actually there's there's a lot of you know chronic disease and autoimmune issues you know especially in the ones who eat a lot of plant-based sort of material um so no they're not all plant-based you know, are they eating more plants in America? Maybe, but what they're really doing is eating less processed food. And also they're not smoking and they're not drinking and they're not having caffeine and they're not having any other stimulus because these are all against the tenets of the church and they don't do drugs and they don't engage in, you know, uh, you know, you know, a high risk behavior. You know who also does that? The Mormons who have the exact same increased life expectancy uh, as the seven day Adventists and have no such dietary restrictions or compulsions. And so, you know, they, they admit that one. Okinawa, they eat a lot of pig, they eat a lot of pork, they eat some yams or two, fine, <laughs> that's okay. They don't eat a bunch of processed garbage. They're not eating a bunch of fructose, high fructose corn syrup, a lot of processed sugar and seed oils, right? They're eating whole foods and they're eating a lot of meat. So it's not because they're eating less meat. First of all, they eat more meat per capita than the rest of the Japanese population with whom they're compared to and compared against. Um, yeah, they eat a lot of yams too. Maybe the majority of their calories come from plants, but they still eat more meat than they, uh, than, uh, other people. And it's, it's whole foods. They're not eating this processed crap that did not exist a hundred years ago. Right. So they're not putting things in their body that did not exist hundred years ago. So they're in, they're in the camp post agricultural camp. Right, they're five inches shorter. Their brains are smaller. They're weaker. They're more likely to get sick and die young, but they're not like in the insane disease state that the majority of the world is finding themselves in now. And then you know, and, and you could just go on like this on all, all, all their examples of the blue zones. Uh, and there's so many critiques on the blue zones because there's so much to critique on the blue zones. But one thing that, that they don't, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of um, there's a lot of native populations who maybe they have a lower average life expectancy from birth. You know, Messiah, they say, oh, they only live to 60. No, that's average life expectancy from birth. And when you, when you're having babies out in the, in the, you know, in the savannah, when lions and hyenas are running around and the infant mortality rate is sky high and you have to fight off lions from eating your cattle or your family with a stick right? Your life is a little different, isn't it? And so you might die from other causes. And so it's not that they're like just getting knocked off from, from heart disease, they're extraordinarily healthy people. And when they die of old age, it's a, a extreme age. The Native Americans in the 1800s, they were routinely living well over 100 as fit, healthy, active adults living in a stone age fashion right? No, none of the comforts of, of uh, modern society and medicine, you know, much to their benefit. And, you know, and they were eating largely just Buffalo and they were, they were known to be their studies showing that they were the, the tallest population on earth. Not anymore. Average height of a population denotes the average health of the population and the native Americans who were eating basically just a 100% carnivore diet, maybe a bit of berries and a couple of things here and there, but mostly just pemmican and buffalo. And, you know, they were the tallest human beings on earth, right? And they were also extraordinarily healthy, lived extraordinarily uh, long lives. And so, you know, they're, they're not looking at those populations and look like, wow, do you have a whole bunch of people living over 100 years old? That's amazing. They didn't look at those, right? But let's just look at the ones that we have, you know, uh, government issued, 
um, government issued uh, birth certificates that we trust. And it shouldn't trust it from a lot of countries, but um, from Hong Kong, I think you can trust them. And Hong Kong has the highest life expectancy from birth of any uh, of any you know, you know modern population. Period, and they eat more meat per capita than any other modern population either. So, you know, why wasn't that included in the blue zone? Why wasn't that, you know, um, why wasn't that looked at as saying, hey, actually, this goes against that? So maybe it's not the plants. Maybe it's something else that they're doing. Maybe it's they have, you know, strong family commitments. Maybe they're they are uh, just omitting processed foods, and uh, in a lot of places, they're actually eating more meat than the populations around them and and certainly cutting out a lot of processed garbage. I don't even know how much processed garbage Hong Kong is cutting out. You know, it's a major, it's, you know, it's a major metropolitan city. So they're probably, they have full access to high octane crap as well. And they're eating a lot of meat on top of that. And they live longer than, than everyone else. So there are a lot of problems with the blue zones and uh, they're definitely not plant-based and, and the people living over 100. It's not because they are not eating meat. It's because they are not eating other crap and living their life in a much better way in other regards. Great. It's so impressive how you have all these facts and figures. I just want to say this real quick. I, I wish I mentioned this on our other video. There's a link in the description that we did a week ago, but the other video we did wasn't live and Dr. Chafee didn't see any of these questions. So when he's, and he didn't see any of these questions today either. So when he's rattling off these facts and figures and truth, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, that last video really resonated with people. So there's a, a link down Good. in the description below. Uh, how about we do maybe one more and then I'll jump over to the comments. And again, some, lots of new sure. people on here, a whole bunch of people. If you have any arguments against the carnivore diet or reasons that you didn't want to start the carnivore diet, please try to leave those in the comments, maybe a big Q next to them and we'll, we'll tackle some of those next. So here's one more. If the carnivore diet is so good, why are there no peer reviewed studies to back it up? And are there any legit studies that actually support carnivore? So, um, depends on the journals you're reading. So there, there was a study done specifically on, you know, modern day uh, Americans uh, who are carnivore uh, done by Harvard and it's peer reviewed and um, uh, with over 2000 uh, participants and people say like, oh, well, this is just a survey. People ask questions of it. Like, yeah, that, that's how nutritional research is, is done. You know, that that's how, that's how they do it. You know, all those studies that say like, oh, more fiber is better and more, you know, vegetables is better. This is how they did it. You know, they asked people what they were eating and what their medical issues were. That's that's it. You know, and so, you know, this is this is actually this is actually more rigorous than most of those things. And it's certainly much more honest because the authors uh, were not you know, thinking that they were going to get this answer. They were, they were actually probably looking like, Oh, let's, let, let's show the harm this is causing. Right. And you can, you can read the shock in the, in the author's uh, you know, minds when they're writing this, they're, they're, they're really surprised at the massive positive results. Everyone improved. Right. As only like, you know, that massive numbers, like the vast majority of people, it, you know, improved or, or put into remission their type two diabetes, their autoimmune issues, corrected blood pressure, collected, uh, corrected uh, blood tests in other regards as well. And the vast majority of people did that. And so, you know, that has already been done and it's great because that opens the door and, and gives us some legitimacy and opens the door to other bigger studies, po possibly interventional studies, which I think would be very important. Um, and, but, you know, there, there are tons and tons of studies that, that you know you can glean information off of first of all there are thousands of studies now going over decades actually really 100 years looking at ketogenic diets and how this helps massively with health well what is a carnivore diet a carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet it's a more stringent ketogenic diet it's not only are you cutting out carbs you're also cutting out the rest of the plants too and the fats that you're getting in to raise up your ketones are animal fats they're not not plant oils and seed seed oils and things like that so it's just a more whole food, natural, optimally um, designed ketogenic diet. So there are tons of studies showing you, you have massive health benefits from ketogenic diets, which a carnivore diet is or should be. And, you know, and then, and then other studies showing that, you know, just getting rid of seed oils gives a massive, massive 
boost to health and, you know, maybe even, uh, you know, can help reverse a lot of uh, issues and diseases as well. So you can, you can glean a lot of information from that. And then you look at studies, uh, just looking at what humans ate and our biology and our, our, you know, the anthropology and uh, paleoanthropology and looking, okay, what did humans actually eat? Well, what we've been eating for the past 2 million years is what we're supposed to eat. What lions have been eating for the last 2 million years is what lions are supposed to eat. What koalas have been eating for the last however long they've been eating eucalyptus is what they're supposed to eat, right? So this is, this is what you're biologically designed and adapted to eat. You can't eat something for 2 million years, survive as a species and thrive as a species if you are not already biologically evolved to it and designed to, to eat it, or you have then become optimized to it. It just doesn't work like that. That's just not how biology works. And so I've, I've heard this, this argument um, from Simon Hill, which I just thought was insane. He's like, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, you know, I'm not arguing that, you know, people, you know, have been eating meat for 2 million years, but you know, it's probably not optimal, it's probably suboptimal. This thing that we've never eaten before in hum human history, that, I, you know, that that's definitely better uh, because, you know, some study said so like, I just don't care. You know, you don't understand biology from a fundamental level. If we've been eating meat for 2 million years, even if we didn't start out as it being optimal for us, it definitely would have become optimal for us. That's just how biology and evolution work. And so, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a bit preposterous to say that what we've been eating for 2 million years is not what we are designed to eat and what we would be benefited to eat. Can we use plants as medicine? Sure. Can we use it as a, as a crutch to get us through a famine? Absolutely. And we have, and I think that's a, that's a serious survival advantage, but that doesn't mean that it's optimal. Right. And so, um, you know, so there, it just depends on the journals you're reading. So you need to go to first principles. You need to look at, at biology, biochemistry, at uh, organic chemistry, understand botany. That's a big one. You know, understand how our bodies work, understand what we are designed to eat. And then, you know, and then you don't, you don't need anything else. I mean, that's, that's really what, fundamentally what it comes down to. Uh, but there, there are a lot of studies. That's what people say. Well, well, show me the study that, that proves this straw man argument that I'm going to put out there right now. It's like, well, that's not how this works. You know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information, but it, it's all coming from different directions to then, you know, piece together into the whole. But I think the fundamental one is, you know, you're looking at what, what we've been eating for 2 million years. And, uh, you know, since the dawn of man, depending on when, when you think that is, you know, what have we been eating this whole time? It's, for the most part been meat and that's what we've thrived on you know when we, during the ice ages what what plants were available to eat exactly you know what were people eating when they crossed the land bridge through the arctic circle in the last last ice age to cross from asia into north america what 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 yams were available then you know where where was the honey and fruit and manna from god you know no there was they, you, there was meat and that's what you were eating and you know you cannot just barely survive an ice age Right. You know, if, if the, you know, the Simon Hill theory of like, oh, well, everyone was just dying and getting heart disease and cancer and all that. So no, no, no record of that. Absolutely no evidence of that. It's pure supposition. That is a pure, pure, pure uh, accusation with a baseless accusation. Um, you know, all these people were just dying off and things like that, getting cancer and all that sort of stuff. No, because if they were, they would be too sick to survive and thrive. During an ice age, you cannot just eke out an existence. You know, a bunch of people on life support and chemo are not making it through an ice age when you have to hunt mammoths and fight off saber toothed cats and ice bears and things like that. You know, that's not that's not going to work. So if you are if you do not thrive, you are going extinct during an ice age. And we not only thrived, we dominated. We we went all over the globe and absolutely dominated every other animal species. That is how you become an apex predator. We are the apex predator of apex predators. We eat regularly all other apex predators. At least we used to before a lot of these things were put on, on the endangered list. So, you know, that is, um, that's what you really need to understand. You need to go to first principles, think about our physiology, our biology, our biochemistry, and uh, you know, and our, our evolutionary history. It's pretty straightforward. We were eating meat. We we're eating plants too, sometimes. Not during the ice ages. Sorry. Sorry to break it to you. And um, and 
in a lot of areas, even when we did have plants available, like the Plains Indians and the Aboriginals in Australia, there are many records that are very clear that even when there's plants available, they chose to eat meat instead. And people in Southern Canada, what is now Southern Canada during the uh, colonial period, uh, there are many accounts. I mean, I read these in high school talking about how like, well, look, it's, it's covered in ice, you know, nine months out of the year. So granted you can't grow crops, you know, during that time you have to eat meat, but you know, surely during that three months you could, you could live off the land. Right. And, and they said, but yet they don't, they only eat meat. They only hunt. They continue to only hunt. And it just blew these guys' mind. They were like, why, why would you live like that? That's crazy because it's the healthiest way to live. That's why. And, uh, you know, it's the best way to do it. And so, you know, even then, even when they had access to plants, they weren't, they weren't using them unless they had to, unless they were starving or needed, needed to use them medicinally. And those are just the facts and the facts are the facts. Great. Man, we have almost 1,200 people here on my side. The, the, wow. Jesus. Yeah. So many great comments. We really appreciate all the comments. Uh, Dr. Chafee, you have your YouTube channel and the podcast. I was just going to mention to people, we're getting some questions that are just sort of personal carnivore questions, and then we're getting some that are more arguments, kind of looking for more of the arguments. But if you have the uh, if you have the questions, you're doing lots of uh, Q&A live streams. Is that right, Dr. Chafee? Um, I'm more recently. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I want to do them more regularly. So I'm like Friday morning, Perth time, Thursday evening, uh, USA time. I'll be, I'll be doing a regular, regular spot. Um, like I did this past week. And so I'm going to start doing that, that sort of regularly. Great. Yeah. So be sure to check out his channel. So now I'm going to jump into a few, uh, questions and arguments from the viewers. Uh, let's see. We got quite a few here. Oh, here's one. Uh, why do we have canines? I hear this one a lot. Mm. Our teeth show that we're supposed to eat vegetables and not meat. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, that, that, that's the thing too. And, and, um, you know, people will say, well, well we have canines. So that means that we must eat meat. Um, and people say, well, but we don't have canines like, you know, a dog does or a lion does. Well, and, and then again, and then these same people think that you should feed, uh, your dogs and cats with big fangs, plant-based diet, and that's best for them too. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there. Um, we have, uh, we have primate teeth. We are primates, right? And so we have teeth similar to other primates. And then we, we've just sort of changed biologically in, in one direction or another, right? Um, we do not have big, large fangs like uh, a wolf or a lion. And that's because we don't kill things with our mouths, right? So we developed tools. We developed our brains. Our brains grew exponentially when we became, we, first of all, it was, it was growing bigger and bigger as we were eating more meat. And then it exponentially grew when we became apex predators. And uh, because we're getting extremely highly nutritious food and we had to be smart about it. We had to use tools. We had to survive during really nasty times. We didn't have big, thick, woolly fur. We didn't have big claws and teeth that we could just tear down and just rip down a mastodon and eat it. You know, we had to, we had to figure out how to outclass an animal that dominated us on every physical metric. You know, I mean, we figured out how to go into the ocean and take out whales for God's sakes. I mean, this is, this is, this takes a lot of strength and a lot of intelligence and a lot of tools, right? We had to figure out how to build a damn ship and all, all the equipment and things like that to go whaling. So this takes a, a lot of intelligence. And so it, it, you know, it's selected and designed uh, for intelligence as well as strength and as well as size. We got taller, we got stronger, we got smarter and we developed more tools. And that's why we live in houses and lions don't because we develop the intelligence to make these tools and tactics to take down these animals where a lion just needed its physical characteristics. It didn't need to, to be smart enough to figure out how to do it. It had to be smart enough to be able to know where the food was and how to get it and how to survive, but it didn't need to be so much more intelligent that it had to be able to figure out um, tricky ways to get around the fact that we don't have big claws and teeth. So, we have primate teeth with carnivorous adaptations to our species. So our teeth are smaller than a gorilla's, right? Because, you know, as we're eating softer and softer food, 
our teeth are getting softer and softer. We're not chewing on sticks all day like a gorilla, right? Gorilla has massive teeth, big old fangs too, big old canines, right? You look at it, you look at a gorilla showing its fangs. It has big fangs. They're herbivores, right? They only eat plants. They'll get some bugs with the plants. They eat their own feces as well because that's the only way they can get B12 because no, B12 does not come from plants and it doesn't just come from the bacteria in the dirt. It comes with bacteria in their colon, but that's past where they can actually absorb B12 in their small intestine. So they have to eat their own feces to then put that back through for another pass and get those nutrients that weren't there the first time, right? Any, any vegan wants to do that, you can do that. I'm just going to stick with steak, right? right. And, um, you know, and so we're not chewing on sticks all day. So we have smaller and smaller teeth, smaller and smaller jaws, smaller uh, muscles of mastication, our temporalis muscle, right? In a gorilla, when you look at a gorilla's head, it's a big head. Its brain's tiny. It's small. It's actually the smallest for its size of any primate. Most of that bulk in its head is not skull. It's those, it's those chewing muscles. Mm. And that attaches to a ridge down the middle here. And so this big, big clump of muscle there. And so uh, we didn't need to do that. We're eating softer and softer food and all of that stuff is shrinking down and our, our digestion changed dramatically as well. Um, but that's, that's the answer for the teeth. We, if you look at primate teeth, you go to the zoo, sometimes they'll have models up of chimpanzees and, and gorillas and things like that. You'll see it's like, this is, this is sort of similar. They're much bigger and they actually have big pointier fangs and things like that. But that's, um, that's what it is. We have primate teeth that have evolved in the direction that we evolved, which is eating meat. Got it. We had a, a couple of super chats. Here's from Barry Simon. Oh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you so much for the super chats, too. Any super chats I get on my channel, they all go towards the carnivore diet documentary. So I really appreciate that. Is grass finished measurably better to eat? Kind of a question there but then this other one i get a lot of people weary about starting mm. carnivore because they're worried about fiber issues how do you offset constipation issues sure so uh yeah grass finished uh it is or you actually can measure how much better it is it um it it quite often will have you know any number of times more uh nutrients uh, especially the micronutrients like you know the, the vitamins and minerals and things like that that come with it um you look at i've spoken to some regenerative ranchers and um you know their their beef is four or five times more nutritious has four or five times more vitamins and minerals than than you know what would be published in uh you know in the from the data and the, the normal stuff that you get at sort of like safeway or something like that um and, uh, you know, but, but grass finished isn't necessarily regeneratively raised. So, you know, if you have, you know, you're rotating, you know, pastures and, and, the, and the ground is getting more and more fertile and more and more abundant and you can, and, and more and more healthy then the cows are going to get more and more healthy and nutrient dense as well. And so if they're doing that in that manner, they will be even more, uh, nutritionally dense. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, even, even the Safeway beef is extremely nutrient dense. It's more nutrient dense than anything else you'll eat, certainly than any other plant on earth and is completely bioavailable as well. So the vast majority of people do not only just fine, do amazingly well on just store-bought, you know, grain finished beef. Uh, there are more nutrients in the regeneratively raised animals there. I mean, that's just, that's just a, a, an objective reality. Uh, and there's a different complement of uh, fatty acids as well, you know, sort of better fatty acids, more omega threes, things like that, less omega sixes, um, and uh, uh, there's more like branch chain amino acids for some reason in the in the the grain finished cows as well. Some people think that that's not a good thing. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know of any rigorous studies on that. I've, I've only seen sort of um, associative studies. With that, so I don't know, uh, and certainly not on carnivores. But either way, you know, um, it is different. Uh, but does that make a marked difference in your health? We don't have great studies on that. The studies that we do have generally are people in a mixed diet, and so this have grass fed and finished, and you know, who knows what grass finished is? You can you can actually say something is grass fed. Uh, if it's ever eaten grass in its life, because that's just how they market these things. Uh, so you have to, you have to know that this is 100% grass fed and finished. Um, and, uh, you know, so some of these studies, you know, depending on you know, their, their end points and end markers didn't 
didn't really see too much of a difference in health between one or the other. That, that's not to say that there isn't one. It's just that we don't really have a study uh, that's been designed in that manner. But there is an objective difference, absolutely. Uh, most people do just fine. If, you, if you're eating just Safeway beef, I, I mean, I mostly eat Costco beef and because that's what I have access to. I can't really get you know, grass, you know, we're generally raised uh, things out here. I'm trying to source that sort of stuff. I'm, I might have to get it shipped over from the East coast from, uh, you know, my friend, um, you know, uh, Wolke from Wolke farms, uh, because he, he does exactly that. And he has, you know, super highly nutritious, uh, you know, animals out there. Um, but you know, I've checked my bloods, I've checked the bloods of my patients and, you know, check their vitamins and minerals and things like that. They're all in, in optimal ranges and in much better ranges than the normal, uh, the normal good range of like, oh, well, it's, 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 it's in range, so it's fine. Most people are vitamin deficient and mineral deficient. And so that reference range is actually too low. And so if you actually want to look at optimal range, like this is the best, this is where you want to be for good health, that's a very different range. And so that's what, what I look at. And it's, um, and, and, and they're at least approaching that on a carnivore diet, just eating, you know, Costco beef or whatever. Um, and that's what I'm doing. And my, all my numbers are right up there in that, that optimal range. So, um, some people will be a di bit different. Some people, especially with like the MTHFR gene, I've spoken to, you know, sort of a, a, several people, a growing number of people now, especially who have that, they can't metabolize folate as well. And they seem to get, you know, symptomatically low folate. A lot of people will have sort of just an off number on their folate or something like that. And they're not really symptomatic with anything. You know, I, I still tell them probably top it up just you know, because, um, but some people are symptomatic and they don't feel their best. And so, you know, maybe they might need, uh, to get that grass finished or, or maybe add in a bit more liver, which is what, which is even more nutrient dense. And so just something to think about, but you know, if, if you're, if, if that's all you can afford and that's all you have access to, that's, it's still amazing. You know, it's still better than anything else. It's like silver medal at the Olympics, right? So grain finish got silver medal, right? Silver medal lost to the gold medalist, right? But silver medalists also beat everyone else on earth. So it's still the better option if you can't get grass fed and finished. Uh, how do you offset constipation? You eat more fat. If you're getting constipation, it means you are not eating enough fat. I did a whole video on this. It basically says you don't need fiber. Uh, it's called fiber constipation and, and diet. And it just goes through how our digestion works and how it's actually run by fat. And we only have a limited capacity to absorb fat based on the amount of bile in our liver and, or that our liver produces. And, um, after you've absorbed all the fat you can with the bile that you have available, it's very difficult to absorb fat. So the vast majority of it will go out, right? Like, you know, 85, 90% will go out. And that is what keeps your stool soft. And so if you're not getting as much fat as your body wants, your body will absorb every ounce of fat that you're eating. None will go out the other side. It will get all dry and rocky and hard and not fun. But if you are eating more fat than your body can absorb, first of all, it's not too much. There's no such thing as too much. If you're not absorbing it, it just goes out, right? As this is actually what people say, oh, I'm getting diarrhea on a carnivore diet. So people get worried about going into it with car with constipation. And then they go into it and go, my God, I'm, I can't leave the bathroom, you know? And so you, know, you get, you get the other side of it. And that's because they're eating a lot more fat or normally they're still drinking coffee and using artificial sweeteners, which are both laxatives. Um, so, but I, you know, regardless, if you're getting constipated and constipation, you have to define your terms because most people think, well, if I haven't just gone to the bathroom daily, then I'm constipated. That means I'm blocked up. No, that does not mean that you're absorbing 98% of the meat that you eat. You can't absorb any fiber. So all of that comes out. So we're just used to eating all this bulk that has to come out, has to come out. So people are, you know, they're going to the bathroom a few times a day and they're like, oh, that's normal. I didn't go today. I didn't go to, I, you know, I've talked to some people and they're, they get so worried about this. They're giving themselves laxatives they're giving themselves enemas. I'm like, okay, is there a big clog coming out? Well, no, it's just all liquid. I'm like, then you didn't need to go. <laughs> There's nothing there. There's nothing blocked. Oh, but I'm blocked up. Well, but you're not blocked up because no blockage came out, right? It was all liquid. It doesn't liquefy the stuff. It just, it just moves it, right? That's what a laxative does. And so, you know, you will absorb 98% of the meat that you eat if you're not eating it with plants that will disrupt the absorption of the meat that you're eating. And so you will just go less often because you will have less waste, right? But it should still be soft. So constipation is by the Bristol stool chart, right? So that's, um, that, that's consistency, not timing. 
not frequency, right? So as long as it's soft, you're not constipated. If it's dry and hard, that's constipation. You need to eat more fat. Got it. Less waste in, less, less waste out. That's it. All right. Here's another one, another super chat. Thank you so much. And this one is is uh, a little off topic, but kind of not because a lot of people are worried about carnivore long term. And Dr. Chafee, you've been doing carnivore for a while. So this person was asking, uh, could you compete now at the same level you did at 25 physically? And how do you think you will hold up physically into your 50s, 60s and 70s? Well, I, I don't have to guess because I, I did it. You know, my, um, you know, when I went back on a carnivore, uh, two weeks after being back on a carnivore diet, when I'm when I realized this is what I was doing in my early 20s, when I absolutely felt like a superhero and and you know performed physically like one, um, I was just like, right, that's what I was doing. I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get rid of these stupid things, and I just I just ditched them. And then I realized I'm like, this is actually our biologically appropriate diet. This makes sense now, and everything started started making sense to me as a doctor, as a biologist, and from my own experiences, right? And so. You know, I, I always remember looking at that period, that five year period in my life as just like I just felt like a absolute just demigod, you know, and it was just like, it was like, what, what was so special about that? And I always think back about that because I was like, it was like, well, I wasn't drinking. I'd stopped drinking during the rugby season. At the same time, I had stopped eating plants and I had just uh, obviously had a huge benefit from stopping drinking. That made a massive difference, but I just all of the benefits I attributed to that. And, um, and that was a big part of it, you know, it comes from plants, you know, so we want to get rid of those plants, but, um, you know, it wasn't all of it. And so, you know, the rest of the, the rest of the time in my late twenties, you know, when late twenties, early thirties, when I was still playing rugby at a very high level, I did not feel the same way. I was still not drinking during the rugby season. I never drank during the rugby season. It was very rarely. And, uh, and I was just figuring out, well, I'm just older now. I'm over 25. You're just dying. You just start dying after 25. It's not the case. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so when I was 38 and I came back on this and I was overweight, out of shape, had just been in, in Bangladesh doing humanitarian work and was certainly not working out while I was over there. Hadn't played a full season of rugby in three years. I'd been helping out with family uh, health emergency and, uh, and really just, you know, just doing that and focusing on, on my family. And I felt so good after two weeks and I just, I just felt so amazing. I, I was just like, this is, this is incredible. Uh, I wasn't getting sore after working out. I lost 23 pounds in 10 days. And then I just started just stacking on muscle. I was doing crazy workouts. I was doing 20 sets of, of everything. Couldn't get sore. I ended up pushing myself doing 32 sets of squats just to see if I could wear myself out. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I still wasn't sore the next day, which out of everything I say, that seems to piss people off the most. Bullshit. You get sore. I'm like, I don't. I just don't. I'm sorry. You know, you won't either if you, if you just stop eating plants, mostly carbs. Yeah, that's mostly grains and carbs and things like that. That, that seems to do a lot, most of it. And so, you know, what on that time I did 32 sets of squats. Um, the next day I wasn't sore. I felt great. I was walking up the stairs two at a time, just going just like I hadn't done anything. And I was like, great, let's go hiking. Went hiking with a friend up this like three hour hike. It was, you know, it was miserable, felt fine. There was no issue. Uh, got to the top. Everything's fine. Came back down. I was like, you know, I am just feeling amazing. Like, you know, it's Thursday night, it's rugby practice tonight. I'm going to play rugby. And so I went back out with my, my team, the Seattle Saracens are now the Seattle Seawolves. It was their first year of going into major league rugby and, and now just turned professional. So they had all these professional players from the U S and, and other countries that are now playing there, ended up winning the whole MLR uh, that year and the next year, which is fantastic. And I was like, yep, going back out, I'm playing some rugby and I was still very out of shape. You know, I'd only been you know, on a carnivore diet for two weeks and, you know, but I just felt so good. I'm like, I'm going to push myself. You know, I remember this, you know, I could push myself. I could just push myself as hard as I could and I could never wear myself out. Let's see if I can do that still 38 years old, did that having not played a full season in three years. Mm -hmm. And I was at a dead sprint the whole time. Felt absolutely amazing. I was step for step with, with everyone there who'd been training for months before that. And I just felt great. I didn't look great. It was, I did not look like I was in shape, but I was able to compete just because of my diet. Two weeks after that, we did a fitness test. I've, I've finished, you know, I think probably in the top five or 10 out of 92 
uh, players on the team. I'd only been running for two weeks. It was all diet. I just, I just felt absolutely incredible. Um, unfortunately, uh, later on in the season, I ended up uh, uh, hurting my knee and, and and flaking off some cartilage underneath my kneecap, and just you know swelled up my knee. I got an effusion, and I uh, I wasn't able to play. Unfortunately, that really bummed me out. But my body felt amazing, and I was playing in you know in different uh, games with the Saracens and the Canadian Premiership, and and um, you know, and I just felt amazing. My body felt I felt like I did when I was twenty two except I had, you know, another you know, 15 years of experience now, you know, it was, and, and, you know, more, more, you know, bulk. So I was, I was still pretty bulky and I was, I was trying to slim down and, um, you know, and I, I, I just felt absolutely amazing. I felt like I was a kid again. I felt better at 38, uh, than I did at 28 playing in the super league at on back in San Diego. You know, I just, I felt absolutely amazing. And, um, and, you know, I kept, I kept going like that. So I, I was able to rehab my knee, got that better, came down to Australia and, uh, started playing in the, in the Western Australian, um, premiership here with one of the teams, um, you know, great group of guys. And, um, you know, I, I then had, uh, you know, was in very good shape at that point, had slimmed down, was quite lean and muscular. And I was, I was, you know, 39 years old. And I'm going and I'm, I'm pushing myself and I'm physically, athletically, speed wise, endurance wise, you know, I, I was at the top of the pack and, um, and, you know, and then people sort of mentioned something about age and the guy that I played rugby with, who was, a, it was a, an Irish guy. And one of the other guys knew him and they were like, yeah, you know, he's getting older now. He's, you know, he's, he's 35 and I'm like, oh, I'm 39. And he's like, you're 39. I was like, yeah. It's like, you didn't know that. He's like, Jesus. And so that, that sort of sent ripples around. They're like, holy crap. They're like, okay, we're really going to actually pay attention about this carnivore diet now because you're, you know, you're 15, you know, 20 years older than, than a lot of these guys. And, and, you know, you're, you know, very fit, very strong, very fast. And uh, unfortunately I had uh, my other knee flaked off cartilage and uh, had the same sort of effusion and problem. And I wasn't able to finish that season. And, um, uh, since then I have not had the time <laughs> to get back into it. Uh, but, I absolutely feel fantastic. Um, physically, I can still lift weights for hours, you know, even though my knees hurt because I have uh, arthritis under my kneecaps, bone on bone arthritis under my kneecaps. The rest of the knee is pristine. The rest of my joints throughout my body are pristine. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not pristine. But I have a lot of pain and it, it just doesn't really bother me. It's much less. Than if I was or eating other things, that pain would be much more. But like physically, athletically, if it wasn't if it wasn't for the fact that my knee would swell up if I you know sprint or anything like that, um, I would be there right now, playing and hitting people. Like I cannot tell you how good that would make me feel to just <laughs> smash somebody, you know, <laughs> the rugby field because that that was just my that was like my joy in life <laughs> was right. doing that. Um, but you know, I mean, just today I went and went sprinting. Um, you know, uh, doing hill sprints, stair sprints and things like that. It's all fine. So, you know, as long as my knee doesn't blow up, I feel fantastic. So, you know, uh, to answer that question, I, I feel fantastic. I expect in my 50s, 60s and 70s, I'll feel exactly like this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, hopefully there's some sort of miracle cure at that point. I can regrow some cartilage. And, uh, you know, if, if it can, I mean, I'll be in my fifties smashing some heads, you know, <laughs> it'd be amazing. And it, won't, it won't be in, it won't be in the fifties and older club either. Like I'll be there, you know, uh, you know, mixing it up with the young with, guys. Uh, yeah. Everyone. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I gotta show you this picture, Dr. Chafee. So I did an interview with this gentleman, Alex from the UK. Um, mm -hmm. and it's pertinent to this comment in the fifties, sixties and seventies. Hopefully this will show up. Okay. Here so you see this picture. This mm -hmm. guy is a carnivore for over a year now. His name's Alex. I just did a video with him. You see the after picture on the right. You want to take a guess at how old that, that gentleman is on the right? Well, it looks like he's about, well, he could be anywhere from late 20s to 35. Um, but, you know, obviously it's a loaded question because that's the, that's the guy on the left as well who looks well older than that. But he looks... Like he's, he could be anywhere from 28 to 35. I love it. So we had a, 
we had our triplets uh, 16th birthday party yesterday. We had about 50 people over. I told Alex, I'm like, dude, I hope I'm not freaking you out, but I'm showing everyone your picture. The guy on the right, that version of Alex is 65 years old. Jesus. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely. I did a one hour interview with him and just talking to him. I'm like, first, I'm like, okay, this is BS. You Photoshop this photo and yeah. <laughs> I want to see your passport identification. I talked to this guy for an hour and he just has the most inspirational story defying aging. So to mm. Bishop's deep learning question about 50s, 60s and 70s, check out Alex. It's it's unbelievable. Doing carnivore for over a year, changed his entire life. So much energy. Just talking to him on the phone too. He he's, he That's sounds awesome. like he's in his 30s or 40s. He's just just full of life and energy. It's like he's given himself a new life at 65. He's got a whole nother life to live now versus before yeah. where he was having the mob, uh, mobility issues and pains and arthritis and inflammation and all those things. So yeah, I, yeah, it's funny. I, well, yeah, well, it is funny. I mean, because he, he does not look that old, and um, and so that that's that's absolutely fantastic. You know, I mean, we think about well, what what are you going to be in your 50s, 60s, and 70s? Well, what were the Native Americans doing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s? And you know, they, you know, at 100, 110, they were still living as Stone Age nomads, right? Running around with a pack on their back, following the buffalo herds, right? You can't, you know, you sink or swim out there. Right. And so, you know, uh, people can look at the interview I did with Maggie White, who's been a rancher and a carnivore for over 65 years. So she's been just just through pure preference. She just never wanted to eat anything except meat growing up. And she really fought with her parents as a kid. And eventually parents were like, look, she, she hates eating anything else. She's healthy and strong. Let's just let her just do what she wants. So she's basically been eating carnivore her, her entire life after adolescence. And certainly all of her adult life, all of her adult life, because she ended up dropping out of veterinarian school um, at UBC up in Vancouver uh, when she was, um, you know, just just a late teenager. I think she started college early. It was, you know, it was an undergraduate program then. So she was like you know, 17, 18, something like that. And, uh, and she just said, you know, actually, I don't why, I don't want to help treat other animal, other people's animals. I want my own animals. She really loved animals and, and um, you know, big animals and things like that. So she just, you know, quit school and went and worked on a ranch hand, um, became a cowboy. She says her word. She says, if you're, if you're working cattle, you're a cowboy, man or woman, you're a cowboy. And so she went out and became a cowboy. And she was hundreds of miles away from civilization. And she said that the only thing that you ate is what you grew or raised, right? And so they had meat available because they were raising cattle. But if you wanted vegetables or fruit, you had to grow it yourself. And she's like, I'll be damned if I'm going to work to eat vegetables. Like, I don't want to eat vegetables. I'll just eat the meat. Thank you. And so she did. And so she just continued to just eat a meat diet. She raised 10 kids on a meat only diet um, on, on her ranch. And she is 82 years old now. She's five foot 10. She still has blonde hair. She's, I, I didn't see any grays in her hair. And, uh, and that's her hair. And her picture looks like she's maybe in her 50s, like in like a good 50, like a good 50, you know? And she's 82 years old. She's still working. You know, she's still working 14 hour days in blizzards. You know, I was talking to her on Christmas last year. And she was, we were trying to, you know, set up an interview and she was just like, you know, how, Hey, I'm really sorry. You know, it's been like a 14 hour day. We had a blizzard come through. It was minus 40. And we were like, you know, you know, uh, had, had to do these things to save the cows or the cows, you know, will die, you know? And so they, uh, you know, they were just, just working on Christmas, you know, all hours of the day and night, uh, because that's what you do. She just bought another, uh, ranch down in, uh, Columbia to sort of save the family farm down there. And so they did a sort of a rescue operation because, they wanted to um and uh and they have like you know plantains and bananas and coffee and things like that she's 82 years old and she's she was emailing me talking about how she's climbing up 20 30 foot trees to cut off bunches of bananas lower them down to the ground and then carry them you know up a hill to get to the truck so they can take it to market at 82 Right. Wow. You know, I mean, I mean, most 20 year olds aren't able, capable of doing that these days, right. you know, and, um, you know, so she so that's what you're going to be like in your 80s. Right. And, you know, and like I said, you know, Native Americans were living well over 100. We are biologically, genetically designed to live 120 years based on the length of our telomeres. That's what I was taught in genetics. And, you know, so 80 years old is literally middle aged. Right. Certainly 60 is. 
And so, you know, and that's what she says. She's like, look, I'm middle-aged. That's it. I've, I've still got a lot of life left in me. I've still got a lot of work left in me. I'm, you know, the stuff, the stuff makes me happy. So this is what I'm going to keep doing. Um, I had another, um, just another quick anecdote with, which is uh, a friend of mine who works in uh, geriatrics here in Perth. She had a patient who was 86 years old, had checked himself into a nursing home basically because he couldn't take care of himself at home anymore and his family couldn't either. And so he, he checked himself into a nursing home basically to die. You know, that's, that's, that's what that is. You know, you, you can't take care of yourself anymore. So you're just sort of waiting out your time. And uh, it was very sad. So he somehow came across my videos and he decided to go carnivore just as sort of a last ditch effort of, of getting his independence back within three months. He was not only back living at home fully independent, but he was lifting weights three days a week, swimming twice a week, and had come off all medications at 86. Wow. That is wow. nuts. <laughs> you know, literally aging backwards, literally turning back the clock and, yeah. and curing himself of these major issues and giving himself his independence back. Is that there's, there's no greater gift than, I, than your I, independence. Absolutely. That that's been one of the most sort of touching things with carnivore for me. I've had so many comments on my channel from people in their 60s, 70s and 80s thriving on carnivore uh, over and over again. Uh, that's going to be a big part of the carnivore diet documentary. We're going to talk about obesity, diabetes, um, stomach issues, IBS, autoimmune disorders, but aging is a huge one because who isn't worried about getting older and slowing down? And I'm hearing story after story, like Dr. Chafee just said, of people that are, it's not an issue for them. It's, and th these people are saying it was the inflammation. It was the food I'm eating. It's slowing me down. It's causing me to have arthritis. It's causing me to have aches and pains and you don't have to have those things. So yeah, that's, that's just amazing. All right. I, I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Chafee. Do you want to do a couple more? Yeah, I, I'm I'm good, man. I've got I've got time. So okay. uh, how much time you have? I'm happy. This is awesome. There's, there's so many comments here, though. So there's no way we're going to be able to get to all of them. But like I said, I've got Dr. Chafee's YouTube channel below. Maybe uh, hit him up on one of his uh, live Q and A's. He has coming up. Here's one. Uh, another super chat. Thank you. Can the planet support eight billion humans eating a carnivore diet? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you guys should look up uh, Dr. Peter Ballerstedt, B-A-L-L-E-R-S-T-E-D-T. Um, I, I've interviewed him. I think that's that's quite a good interview. I've seen a lot of his talks, and I was extreme. I was very impressed by him. Um, he's, a, he's a PhD in forage agronomy. He works in this field. He, he really understands the ins and outs of how uh, you know cattle and livestock affect the environment and actually how they significantly benefit it and actually how plant agriculture agriculture crop agriculture commercial monocropping is extraordinary extraordinarily detrimental so it and, and so i have an interview with him and we cover quite a lot there and so that that will answer all of your questions and you just be like this is this is what we have to do not only can the planet support 8 billion people eating carnivore diet uh it has to it's not going to support 8 billion people eating a plant-based diet we have about 50 more growing cycles before we've completely destroyed the integrity of our of our soil, topsoil, and uh, and and growing surfaces. It, it is devastating to the land uh, to grow these crops in the way that we are. We lose about 27.5 billion tons of topsoil per year because of our farming uh, techniques, and we're just tilling up all this all this land, and the, and the topsoil is getting blown away. It takes 500 years to grow a centimeter of topsoil that is that is a that is a limited resource that will go away so 27.5 billion tons of topsoil that's an area the size of kentucky every single year right mm -hmm. and so that's a vanishing resource and um you know i'm not saying this other other, other people are saying this that there are about 50 growing cycles left before we've completely cashed out uh the uh the integrity uh, for, for any sort of commercial purposes anyway and so um, it's, it's, and you cannot have plant agriculture without animal agriculture. It's the animal, uh, you know, manure and, uh, and some of the, the, the waste products of their, of their bodies, like the bone meal and things like that, bone and blood that go into the fertilizer. And that's what puts the nutrients back in the soil that the plants then take out of the soil and, uh, and then we eat them. But I mean, the, the land is getting so depleted in this that the, like the spinach of the 1950s had three times the nutrients that it has now, right? And so, you know, that, that's across the board. 
for plants they're so nutrient deplete now and so you know it's um it's actually imperative that we start eating more animals because that's going to give more manure that's going to actually make the land better people like alan savory dr alan savory uh, who's written books on this textbooks on this has been doing this for 40 years taking herds of animals through bunch of moving like like a migrating herd is re re reversing deserts right so the animals don't turn land into deserts the lack of animals turn land into deserts there's there's a symbiosis there's a symbiotic relationship between plants and animals they need to be able to eat down you know the 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 dead dying overgrown uh, you know, grasses and things like that so that the new sprouts can grow. Um, the, the hooves need to go in and just dig up the turf a little bit so that seeds that roll through, they're round. They don't just, just keep rolling, get washed away with the rain. They actually get stuck there and then they can actually grow. And uh, and then the, the water actually pools and sinks and actually gets into the ground instead of just washing away, washing away, washing away. So there's a lot of things that go into and animals are so important to this. And so, you know, also when you think about it, where are we growing crops? We're growing on arable land, right? So it's just flat land that you can uh, uh, also grow, put cities on because that's, that's what we do. That's what competes with farmland is, uh, is, is, is cities, right? Because you have big flat areas, you can build a whole bunch of houses and buildings, right? Harder to do that in mountains. Um, that accounts for about 4% of the Earth's surface, arable land, including oceans, obviously. So the entire surface of the Earth, about 4% of the, of the entire Earth is arable land, right? Not much in the grand scheme of things. And we're losing an area of Kentucky of topsoil every year, right? But rangeland is like, I think it's about 15% of the Earth's surface. Uh, forest land is about 10% uh, of the surface. You don't need to run animals on arable land. You have to grow crops on arable land, but you can run cattle through rangeland and through uh, forest, right? So the rest of the land, we can actually run animals through and we can make that land much more habitable and much more fertile and much better able to grow more plants and support more animals. I mean, look at the Great Plains when there were hundreds of millions of buffalo and probably over a billion other big, large animals, deer and antelope and all these other sorts of things, right? The, the land was so fertile that, I mean, it was just, it was just one of the most, one of the most fertile and verdant areas in the world. And the grasses were so tall that there were descriptions of, of the explorers being able to tie the grass and knots over their horse's head while on horseback. Right. They were saying it was like over nine feet tall. So it was just like, you know, in the middle of India, like the tall grass where like, you know, tigers are hiding and things like that. Or you're walking through with an elephant or something like that. They were going through that with horses and they weren't able to even see above the grass. They were like, that's, that's crazy. And so the more animals there were, actually the more fertile the land got and the more plant life it could support. So in fact, we have to eat more. We have to raise more animals, have to, because the earth will die out without more animals. And so if we don't do that, we will be in serious, serious trouble. Got it. All right. Here's one. Uh, do you think this diet is optimal for all humans? Is there a chance certain people are more adapted to eating plants the same way people can't digest dairy? Yeah, so um, there are people that are more adapted to eating plants than other people, you know, people of European descent and other areas that have had uh, access to or their ancestors had access to um, uh, uh, agriculture for longer. They're going to have different adaptations to defend themselves a bit better against these different defense chemicals that, that we find in, in plants and the different disruptions to our, our metabolism and our biochemistry that we get from eating this sort of junk. But, you know, that's in comparison to people like the Native Australians, the Native Americans who are four times as likely uh, when eating a Western diet, they're four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest of the chronic diseases, right? But only when eating a, a Western diet, right? And so 
you have to ask you know, that sort of begs a question. Well, what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? Well, what, what they were eating traditionally was just a high fat meat based diet, very little plants, uh, if they didn't have to, uh, use them medicinally or for starvation purposes. And that has changed. And so they're not as adapted to that. So they're much more, uh, damaged by them and, uh, they don't get as much nutrients out of them. They're not as bioavailable to them. So, but what does that mean? That does that mean, does that change what's optimal for them and us? No, that just means that the suboptimal things are less bad for us than it is for them. Right. And so, you know, but that doesn't change what's optimal. Right. So, you know, if, if, you know, if Carrie was, uh, you know, didn't get damaged as much by, by, you know, like lead pipes or something like that, you know, as I did, that did, that doesn't mean that lead is good for carry. It means that it's less bad for him. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not like, like leaded pipes are optimal for you for some reason. It's just, just because you get affected less than I do. So optimal is a very different thing, you know, and you will never find two examples of, uh, two, you know, you will never find an example in nature of two members of the same species who have different optimal diets doesn't exist. Koalas eat what koalas eat. Lions eat what lions eat. Pandas eat what pandas eat. Blue whales eat what blue whales eat and so on. Like that is just, that is just across the board. Why would we be the only exception to that rule? Now there are people that again, can do, can do better comparatively on plants, but that does not mean that those plants are optimal. It just means that they're less bad. Got it. Good stuff. All right. Maybe one more question. Uh, yeah. Wow. We've got an hour and 40 minutes. This has been great. Here's one more. Uh, why do some people get low testosterone on carnivore diet while others like yourself have optimal, even when they're trying to just eat fatty meat? Sorry, let me just read that. Why do some people get low testosterone on carnivore diet uh, while others like yourself have optimal? Even when they try, you know that that's a good question. I mean, I, you know, that's something that that some people have said. I think you know, um, you know, Doctor Saladino thought that his his testosterone may have gotten a bit wonky. You know, I mean, uh, Doctor Baker uh, published his lab results and his his testosterone was fine. Maybe it was just sort of, you know, a bit on the lower end, but it, was, it certainly wasn't low. Uh, look at the guy. The guy, the guy's not low testosterone. You know, the guy's a beast. And one of the things that he pointed out was that when you're eating a lot of carnitine and other sorts of things, you actually increase your testosterone receptors. And so you don't need as much testosterone to get the same or greater effect. And so that could very well be what's going on there is that, you know, just like, and, and people pointed this out for, um, you know, thyroid, thyroid hormone as well. Um, you know, Professor Finney, uh, who has been studying ketogenic diets and how this affects our health uh, for decades. You know, he he talks about this and how you know people's you know thyroid levels you know may go down a bit, but they are completely asymptomatic. They're actually you know better if anything, and uh, you know it goes into why you know this you actually don't need as much because your body's working more efficiently and effectively. So that can happen as well. Um, you can also be eating things that can disrupt your, your, your system as well. You know, I mean, there are people that eat copious amounts of organs. Uh, I don't think you need to do that. You know, certainly, and certainly not eat more organs than you do normal meat because there is no more normal skeletal muscle meat and fat than there are organs by a long, long margin. And so it's, it's very possible that if, if people are eating these things in abundance and they're getting, you know, hypervitaminosis of one thing or another, or, or just, you know, too much of one thing that that can disrupt their, uh, metabolism and their hormones in, in one way or the other, uh, certainly can affect your, your thyroid, uh, hypervitaminosis a was an abundance of vitamin a in liver. So if you're just eating a, just a buttload of liver, you can, you could get that. You can, and it's very hard to clear because, um, vitamin A is fat soluble. It takes a long time to get rid of that. And so, you know, hypervitaminosis A is, is a known cause of, uh, of, uh, suppressing TSH. So as, as you get, even if you're getting sort of borderline higher, uh, vitamin A, you starts going up a bit that can start suppressing your thyroid stimulating hormone. So if you're suppressing your thyroid stimulating hormone, you're not going to get the signal to, to, uh, secrete more thyroid hormone. Right. And so it's, um, you know, your levels are going to go down. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's, 
uh, you know, just because of a carnivore diet, I mean, you're doing something else, you know? And so when, when I sort of advise people to eat this way, uh, I tell them to be cautious about, about organs and eat in proportion of the animal, right? If you're hunting, you take down a deer, it only has the organs that are in that deer and it has a lot of meat otherwise. So the most majority of what you're going to be eating is, is the muscle meat and fat. It has one liver, it has one heart. It's got two kidneys. It's got a spleen, right? So it's not going to have, you know, uh, 50% of your meal should not be organs, you know, and it shouldn't sh certainly shouldn't just be liver every time, you know what I mean? And so people can get those sorts of problems. I, I mean, I, th I think if I remember correctly, um, Saladino's testosterone may have been, may have been affected. I don't actually, I don't, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people make that, um, statement like, oh, well, why are people's testosterone is going down? I've never, first of all, I haven't seen Saladino's blood, so I don't, I don't know this for sure, but, um, I, I think someone was saying that he did, but I'm, I, you know, don't quote me on that. Uh, but literally I just really never seen anybody. I've seen people say that I've never actually seen it. It actually happened to anyone. And in the hundreds of patients that I've, uh, put on this over the years, I see the exact opposite. I see their testosterone going up. I see, uh, their thyroid normalizing. I see their, uh, you know, their B12 and their folate and magnesium and zinc and all these sorts of things going up, going up and up and up and up and up and D3 and all these sorts of things. And so, you know, I only see people getting better. You know, I've had, um, you know, people that I've spoken to, um, and helped out, uh, who are athletes, top athletes that have like literally doubled their testosterone. You know, one guy, uh, more than doubled his testosterone. And, uh, you know, like, like how, how is that not like just the greatest advantage as an athlete? You know, you, you just, without any sort of supplementation, without any sort of over the counter or under the counter sort of, uh, supplements, all of a sudden you've doubled your testosterone and likely your growth hormone and other sorts of things and done it in a physiologically balanced way that the whole body is tuned up to use this appropriately. You know, that is, that is going to be a massive, massive, massive advantage. I have never seen someone's, uh, testosterone go down and their testosterone are going up. And as Dr. Baker said, they're getting a lot of carnitine, their testosterone receptors are going to go up as well. So they're going to get even more bang for their buck, uh, by, by boosting, uh, their testosterone. So, you know, some people say that, but I have, I have yet to see it and I've never seen it on someone who eats, uh, mostly skeletal meat and fat with some organs every now and then, but not going outside of proportionality to the animal. I have never seen that. Mm. It's been my experience as well. Like you were saying earlier, I, I said this on some of my earlier carnivore update videos. I feel like I'm superhuman. Uh, I it just, yeah, my testosterone levels, I'm sure very high. I'm going to do an update video where I get all of my work done and, and share that, but, uh, yeah, definitely feel a, a million times better. Um, wow. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I feel bad cause there's, this just went crazy, which is great reaching a lot of people, which is the goal. Unfortunately, there's just so many comments in there. There's no way we'd ever be able to get to all of them, but anyone that's yeah. from my channel, uh, Homestead, how highly encourage you go subscribe Dr. Anthony Chafee's channel, check out his podcast and, uh, Hit them up on some of the Q and A's if you had a more of a personal carnivore question that we weren't able to get to here today. And uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Chafee. Yeah, no, you're very welcome. Thanks very much uh, for for doing this with me. I I, I think it's great. We had a great turnout. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for coming on. This is uh, massive. I mean, it's a huge amount of people. I'm very sorry we couldn't get to every everyone's questions. I I do wish we could sort of do like a lightning round and just sort of do the, at least like the super chats or something like that. Yeah. 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 Let's um, do it. Do you want to, you want to try to do that? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. I, I know I'm not, no, <laughs> I know that's why we've run out of time because I take 30 minutes to answer questions. So. I think we're seeing the same. I don't know if I, let me see. Here's one. I got that. Yeah. One. I think, I think this in the starred chats and in, in, in our view, um, that should be from both of our channels. So we'll Perfect. see the same stuff. What's a good way to convince my mother who is going through chemo and radiation for breast cancer to eat keto or carnivore? Maybe some books or videos you can point me to. Uh, yeah, uh, doc, uh, Professor Thomas Seyfried, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. He's a professor at Boston College in, in biology. He teaches cancer biology. He's, he's 
published over 150 peer-reviewed uh, studies and papers on uh, cancer biology and keto, um, well over. And um, and so he really shows exactly you know the the cancer biology mechanism and how the the cancers feed on. Um, on uh, glucose as well as glutamine. Uh, breast cancer, there are studies. Uh, there's one in particular looking at triple negative breast cancer, which is an extremely aggressive form of breast cancer, responds extremely well to a ketogenic diet. So I, uh, so he has a book uh, called, I believe he has a book called uh, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. He has talks on YouTube of the same description. Um, he's had a lot of interviews. I've interviewed him on my channel, um, which, you know, I, th I thought that was a fantastic interview. I thought, I mean, just because I just thought it was fantastic information that he was giving. And uh, so you can look that up. And um, I have a lot of links in that description as well to his uh, you know, other works and things like that as well. So I, I would start there. I would show her that interview um, that uh, on my channel with him. Uh, and, and if she's, if she bites on that, you, you might be able to get his book or uh, you look at other resources from there. But I think that's, that's the best way to do it. Great. Another uh, $10 super chat bishops, deep learning. Thank you so much. Um, oh, we got that one already. Infinite epic super chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's see here. Survived an aortic dissection in 2016. Have no gallbladder. Had lost 30 pounds doing carnivore last year, but now the gallbladder issue seems to be causing problems. How should I proceed? Um, well, it depends on what, what gallbladder problems you're having. I mean, you, you don't have a gallbladder, so you know they shouldn't be causing you problems. Um, but um, you know, when if you don't have a gallbladder, really, what you have to, you're just going to have a problem absorbing fat. Your your liver will still make bile, but it just sort of drips it out constantly over the day and night. And, um, and so you have to sort of catch it, you know, because, you know, your, your gallbladder stores it and concentrates it and then spits it out in bulk, uh, to, to absorb a big bolus of fat that you've been sort of waiting up for. So if it's been five days, it's going to have five days worth of bile ready for you all concentrated, ready to go, because it, it still needs the same amount of fat, whether or not you're eating. And so that's how we get gallstones, by the way, is it, it just sits there. We're not eating fat. We're not eating fat. It's not from eating too much fat. It's from not eating enough fat because that sits there and gets concentrated, concentrated, concentrated. Uh, what does any hyper-concentrated solution do at rest? Turns into precipitate, turns into stones and crystals, right? And that's what uh, bile sludge is. That's what gallstones are. Um, and so, you know, if you don't have a, a, a gallbladder, then it's just going to drip out. And so you'll probably have to, if you eat a big meal of fatty meat, you'll probably have diarrhea because a lot of that fat will come out and you won't be able to absorb it. So we'll come out, uh, in that fashion. Um, not everyone does though, you know, um, and they're, they generally form what's called a pseudo gallbladder, which is just sort of an outpouching of the common bile duct. It, it acts the same as a, as a gallbladder It sort of stores bile and it can squish it out. Um, so if you can eat a big, large meal of fatty meat, uh, in one go and not get diarrhea, <laughs> fairly soon after that, uh, then you probably have a pseudo gallbladder and you can just eat, you know, eat, eat normally again, that, you know, that, that thing I did on fiber, fiber constipation and diet, that sort of tells you how to figure out how much fat to get based on whether you're constipated or getting diarrhea. And if you are, can't eat a big meal and without getting diarrhea, then you just need to split up your fatty meals throughout the day. You just need to space those out and eat the same amount but just split it up throughout the day to try to catch that bile as it's, as it's constantly dripping out. Got it. All right. Here's another one. Uh, the part where you guys were talking about poison in moderation reminded me of a stream Dr. Chafee did recently where he told a story of an ancient Greek King and how he became immune to hemlock. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that, that was interesting. There was a guy, um, I, I can't recall his name at the moment, but he was, it was, it was, it was quite ironic and, you know, I laugh as sort of is, is pretty nasty. Um, he uh, he was so paranoid about getting poisoned, like getting his food poisoned, getting his drink poisoned, all this sorts of things. That that happened. A lot of people died from that, uh, you know, in a position of power because someone wanted his spot. And uh, so he would he would microdose with hemlock and other sorts of poisons, uh, and and just constantly do this. He did this for years and years and years and years and years, and maybe survived some assassination attempts. Who knows? 
But uh, then he got invaded. They got taken over. He was sort of, you know, on the run. They sort of cat caught him, and he sort of penned up somewhere. And he's just like, okay, they're going to torture me and humiliate me. I'm just, I've just got to, I've just got to end it. And so he went to just like, you know, Socrates himself, and you know, get drink a glass full of hemlock, and he had, and it didn't kill him. Mm-hmm. And he like he couldn't kill him. He couldn't get. He couldn't give himself enough poison to kill himself. So they ended up catching him alive and and doing whatever they did to him. Unfortunately, but. Um, yeah, so that was it. They were, he was able to build that up and you know, that that's what that is. It is a poison, you know, and you, and you, but you will build up a tolerance to it, you know, tiny little bits and amounts of it. That's what how alcohol is. You get really drunk the first time you do it or you get really high on heroin. And then, you know, every time after that, it's a little less, a little less, a little less until the point that you're just, you know, it takes a couple bottles till you get drunk because you're drinking a bottle every day. And, you know, and then you don't drink for six months and, you know, it's not the same, you know, it doesn't, it's not as, it's not as uh, difficult to get drunk anymore. So there's that tolerance, you know, uh, call it hormesis. If you want, I don't, I call that tolerance, you know, it's not hormetic because it's not giving you an overall benefit. It's only giving you a benefit towards exposing exposure to that toxin. That's not the same thing. Um, but yeah, so, um, yeah, poison in moderation is a bit, is a bit funny. Right. Speaking of funny, I love the I love some of these names. We got radioactive yeah. brawn man. Super yeah. pet, thank you. What about broths and spices in general? Is it fine to add spices, mirapoi for broths and meats? I'm, I'm not familiar with mirapoi, but spices in general. You know, my it, I mean, look, hey, you know, people people do whatever they they want, and you know, and if, it, if this helps you do a carnivore diet and and spice up some meat or something like that, and that keeps you on on track you know by all means do it i feel a lot better without it and you know spices they have that strong flavor because your your brain is trying to warn you you know our 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 tongue and our brain are sophisticated machines and they can identify harmful toxins that that harsh intense taste that that is your brain screaming at you going spit this out do not eat this that's toxic get it out of there you know if you put a mouthful of pepper started chewing that up i mean you'd be, you'd be spitting that out pretty quickly right but we put a little bit on it and we say oh that's nice um i don't actually think it's nice anymore i actually prefer the taste of meat i don't like covering up the taste of meat uh, if you've got to put, put a bunch of spices on meat and things like that probably not eating very good meat you know you should learn how to cook it better and uh, make it nice because you you really enjoy the taste of meat um but for that reason, because this, these, you are that harsh taste, that, that intense flavor is, 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 is toxins. That's what you're tasting. And so I don't feel my best. I don't like that. So for me, what I think is optimal and what I do for myself, uh, I think it's as important what not to eat is what to eat. So you know, you're eating meat, you're eating fatty meat. That's great. But I don't eat any plants or fungus, you know, no, uh, sugar or artificial sweeteners, nothing artificial, right and that goes for sauces seasonings and drinks as well so that's for me that's how i feel my best most people will be able to tolerate spices just fine uh depending on your your heritage broths if it's a meat broth bone broth that sort of thing uh without a bunch of noodles and and uh you know celery and carrots and things like that uh would be great you know um i would avoid all the other things obviously Uh, i will say this depending on your heritage you should probably avoid spices as well so European her- ancestry and spices make me feel a bit crummy for a, an hour or two afterwards. I don't like that. I don't like feeling a bit crummy. I want to feel my best all the time. And uh, But I have spoken to um, a lady who's in my, my challenge group, my 30-day carnivore challenge group, and she, a uh, very nice lady, she was Native American, actually um, Inuit heritage, Northern Canadian. And, uh, you know, just culturally, they ate a lot of meat hunted and, you know, ate moose and things like that, which is like the best tasting animal on earth, by the way, everyone should try it some, uh, if they can. Um, and her daughter had a lot of, of food allergies and food sensitivities that sensitive to poison. I'm not, I'm not you know, shocked about that. So she said for about 40 years, they'd, they'd been carnivore. They were just eating meat but they were eating spices as well. So she used a lot of spices in her cooking, but they only ate meat. They didn't have any size. So she was doing this for 40 years. She was in her mid fifties, late fifties, and she looked extraordinarily young for, and, and healthy for her age. But she said that she had actually four autoimmune diseases, you know, which is quite surprising having been doing carnivore for 40 years, but she was using spices. And so she said, she looked at my challenge. And I said, and my thing is just basically 
you know, the la getting rid of the last 5% of, of plants makes 95% of the difference. And that's just been my, my experience is that people get a big, big bang for their buck, just getting rid of that last little bit of it. And she was like, well, it, that can't be what it is. That can't be what's causing my autoimmune issues. It's spices. It's just spices. I'm eating meat already. She tried it for 30 days. She dropped the spices and she's like, damn it. They're getting better. <laughs> and so, so her, as she actually put her autoimmune issues into remission, just dropping spices. Mm. So, you know, if you have, if you come from ancestry that's, that's had spices for thousands of years, you're going to be a bit more tempered to that. And if that, if that makes you happy, uh, I would just be, I would just be sparing with it. And I would look to at some point cutting them out completely and just having a month, 30 days of just, of just meat and water, you know, maybe a bit of salt to taste, but just meat and water nothing else and and just see the difference i think you will be surprised that you uh how much better you feel even without the spices all right uh started carnivore a few months ago from traditional keto love how i feel however i do miss nuts particularly macadamias do you ever eat nuts nope Nope, nope, nope. Next question. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Look, there. I mean, there are plants, so I don't eat plants, you know. And and especially seeds and nuts, uh, grains, beans, legumes. All these things are, are seeds, right? So that's the plant's baby. Everything protects its baby more than anything. And so, you know, this is where you'll generally find the highest concentration of, of toxins, plant toxins. And so, I, I particularly don't eat uh, nuts or seeds or anything like that. Yeah, that was something I think that got me really bad on keto. Um, Mm -hmm. I had way too many and then they're, they're so easy to overeat as well, but yeah, I, I know for certain, I feel a million times better not eating them now. Um, yeah, me too. From Karsten super chat. Thank you. How does carnivore help with debilitating chronic fatigue syndrome progress, but still bad after 11 months ruminant carnivore? Uh, well, you know, look, there, there are a lot of different causes of these sorts of things. We don't, we don't really know. I mean, there's like Lyme disease, there's, you know, there's post-viral fatigue syndrome. There's uh, a lot of other things as well. So it really does depend on what's causing that. Um, but it can help just because it's going to optimize your health in a lot of ways. And it can help your body and your immune system fight off something that's lingering around if there is something or, or try and bolster you up and, and try to rebuild after, you know, an insult that that's sort of torn you down. Um, but these things can take time. These things can take a lot of time. The, the good news is, is you have progressed. That's a good sign, you know, progression, uh, in, in the early stages, which you're still in, I'm, I'm sorry, but 11 months is still, is still early times. Um, that's a good sign. So progression in early stages is a good sign that you'll get, you'll continue to get progression. So just be patient with it. You know, look at that and go like, Hey, I'm, I'm, what am I able to do now that I wasn't able to do 11 months ago? And, and think positively about that. Uh, once you're able to start exercising, exercise, especially weightlifting, anaerobic exercise is, is such a good stimuli for our bodies to, to heal, repair, and to grow and actually age backwards to reverse aging. Um, you, you can lengthen your telomeres by exercising. You will increase your testosterone. You will increase your growth hormone and, uh, and reduce cortisol. All of these things are conducive uh, to better health and to more energy. So when you're able to start lifting weights or doing push-ups, even if it's just a few or a couple pull-ups or whatever, body weight squats, start doing it. Then start doing it more and more and more and more and more. And the more you do, the more you'll be able to do. All right. Another super chat. Thank you, Paul. What advice would you have for someone struggling with binge eating and food codependency? Uh, well, you know, I think, I think carnivore diet is, is really good for that because you, you don't have to limit what you're eating and you don't have the addiction craving that you do with, uh, with carbs and sugar and seed oils and things like that. So you just, you just eat meat until it stops tasting good, fatty meat until it stops tasting good and will stop tasting good. Now you may be used to eating larger portions and you say like, Oh, okay, well, I, I, I should make all this stuff because that's what I'm normally used to eating. You'll find that you'll get to a point, uh, probably, you know, fairly soon into that meal that your body's telling you like, Oof, this is just not enjoyable. I don't like eating this. I don't want to eat this. It's not that you want to eat something. You may want to eat something else. It may not that your body wants you to eat something else. It's that your body's telling you, Hey, you don't need to eat anything else. So it tastes bad. <laughs> like, so meat starts to, it tastes amazing at first. And then if you keep eating it past the point, your body wants it, your body's 
very smart. You have receptors in your stomach that actually track up to your brain to tell your brain how uh, the nutrients that are in your stomach right now. It says, hey, this is what we've got going here. How much more do we need? Yeah, we still need more. Keep bringing it. Keep bringing it. Keep bringing it. Okay, stop. And so that's what that positive feedback from, from good taste is. And then afterwards it, it goes away and it, and it becomes negative impact at that uh, feedback at that point. So people can find that they're like, oh my God, I'm eating. I, I got halfway through the meal and then it took me two hours to finish it. And I, I sort of explained to them, I was like, no, you were actually finished two hours ago. Your, your body was telling you that. So um, you, you get to eat exactly as much as is, is nice to eat. And then your body will naturally tell you to stop. So just stop. Um, carb cravings and sugar cravings, sugar cravings in particular are, are an addiction, just like you know nicotine or tobacco um, or nicotine or, or caffeine or something like that. I mean, th these things just, they, they are drugs. And they give a dopamine response and they, they have a chemical addiction. And, uh, but like any other drug, you can beat it, you know, uh, that chemical addiction goes away after a certain time, usually about two weeks, you know, so usually people's sugar addiction, carb addiction will, you know, sort of settles down or it goes away. Some people a little longer, some people a little shorter, but that's, that's sort of a ballpark of what I've seen. And, um, if you're getting carb cravings and sort of really want to eat something, maybe ask yourself, am I hungry? Is my body telling me I'm hungry? Because your, your hunger signals will be very different. You have to relearn your hunger signals on a carnivore diet because you're not deranging your hunger signals with a bunch of, uh, you know, insulin and leptin and, and, uh, blocking leptin and, and screwing with your blood sugars and things like that. So just eat meat until it stops tasting good. If you're getting carb cravings or, or sugar cravings, ask yourself, am I hungry? Try eating meat. If it tastes good. You're hungry. Keep eating meat, meat until it stops tasting good. And, and just look for the light at the end of the tunnel after two weeks, make it to anybody can make anything, do anything for two weeks. All right. So just get through to two weeks. You'll feel very, very differently. And you'll, you're, and then do another two weeks and another two weeks, and then you're through, man. So usually like the worst of it is, is then that two weeks, you make it to the other side of that. You should be fine. Absolutely. I found myself doing, when I was doing strict keto, uh, if I did it for years, I would incorporate like a cheat day or this, and I would end up binge eating a whole bunch of stuff like Paul's saying mm -hmm. here. My biggest thing I tell people, because some people are like, I'm doing carnivore and they'll do it for uh, a week. And then they're like, I did so good. I'm going to go eat off plan now. Like this is Weight Watchers or something. And for I know for myself, for me, if I had like a little raspberry, I would go off the rails and I'd be eating sugar and I'd be back to binge eating again. So I would also just say, don't cheat, don't cheat on carnivore. It's not, it's not worth it. And it's not like weight watchers or something where you're counting calories. You can knock yourself out of ketosis and then all those cravings come back and then you got to do it again. But yeah, like Dr. Chafee said, you can do anything for two weeks and I have no cravings, no, obviously no binge eating problems at all anymore. Not even, doesn't even cross my mind anymore. I got one from Martin. Nice. Recently, I came across a claim that carnivore increases SHBG, which supposedly messes up the testosterone function. Can you please address that? Yeah, so that's steroid hormone binding globulin. And so, you know, that, that's the difference between your total testosterone and your free available testosterone to, to be working. So you can have your total testosterone be really high, but if your uh, steroid hormone binding globulin is high as well, you're, you're, you're going to have less free T3 that's available uh, and, and, and bioactive. Um, again, not something I've seen, you know, this is just not something I've seen, uh, in labs. This is something, uh, that, uh, Dr. Saladino has mentioned, um, in his own labs, possibly in, in his patient's labs as well. But again, he's, he was telling his patients to do what he was doing, which was very organ heavy, uh, carnivore diet, which is a lot better than a lot of alternatives. But I do think you can run into trouble with, uh, hypervitaminosis. I just, you know, these are, these are nutrient dense to a fault. And so if you're eating too much of these things, like the Inuit don't eat them at all because, uh, you know, the, the, the organs of the, you know, the predators that they eat generally they're eating predators. They're not eating herbivores. And so the, the, vit the vitamins, nutrients, and fat soluble ones are actually more and more concentrated as you go up the food chain, right? So you're eating the organs of a, of a seal after a while, you're going to, you're going to get you're going to get very sick. Uh, you can't eat the organs of a, of a polar bear, bear at all because you'll die. You know, the, if you try to eat a, the liver of a polar bear, like uh, you'll die from, from vitamin A toxicity. So they don't eat the organs. They give those to the dogs. Uh, they just eat the skeletal muscle, meat and fat. That's what you need. And so I do see, 
you know, people having these, these weird sort of issues are generally the ones that are eating a lot of, a lot of, uh, organs, you know? And so I don't know what it is about that. That's, that's raising their, um, uh, you know, steroid hormone binding globulin. Uh, but I know that mine is not raised and I know that I have no patients who have, uh, you know, increased their, uh, SHBG and, and drop their testosterone, their t- testosterone, their free testosterone is going up. And their SHBG is uh, is not going up appreciably, um, and um, you know, and, and it can be affected in other ways as well. It's funny. There's a strong correlation between people with low steroid hormone binding globulin and anxiety, and be, being sort of neuros- neurotic and sort of a bit on edge all the time. You know, so you know, there's weird things that go on with it as well. Uh, you know, what's causing what? I don't know, but. Um, Again, I've, I've never seen that in practice. I certainly haven't seen that in myself. Um, and I've only heard about it sort of on the internet and people just saying, oh, doesn't this do that? Not that I've seen. And I think that's coming from Dr. Saladino who had that experience himself. And I think there are reasons for that. He attributed that to not to being in ketosis too long. Okay, well, I've been in ketosis longer than him and I do not have that problem. The Inuit have, have been in ketosis a lot longer than him and they don't have that problem. Uh, and then people will say like, well, you know, but Inuits don't have high enough ketones. They, that's not, they're not in ketosis. Bullshit. They are making blood sugar. They're making glycogen. They are making ketones. They are not eating carbohydrates. So what the hell do you call it? You know, they're in that so-called fasting metabolism, fasting metabolism, that ketogenic state. They are able to produce, uh, you know, energy and, and mobilize their energy stores from their fat stores and make carbs, glycogen, and ketones. That's what, that's what keto, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about ketosis. I, I really don't care if your ketones are you know, 37. Like I, I've never checked my ketones. I never want to check my ketones. I have no interest in my ketones. I'm just going to eat meat because I'm designed to eat meat. I'm going to let my body get on with it. I get that question a lot too. And I'm like, what would I do differently? <laughs> I just eat meat and I drink water. Yeah. Nothing I can do. Yeah. Yeah, right, I don't know how I would use that information, you know, right. <laughs> like, exactly. like, oh, there's my, my ketones are three. Great. Oh, right. now there's six. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I got, I'm just going to keep working. Thank you. Yep. Looks yeah. like we got one more here from Paulette. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chafee. Can you address debilitating essential tremors? Husband seeing good results from recent DBS, deep mm. brain stimulation. I Googled that. I didn't know that off the top of my head. And <laughs> we both, I'm sure you did. Uh, and we've both gone strict carnivore. Oh, that's great. Well, I mean, there, there's no there's no studies that I know of, uh, even with with keto and uh, tremors. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any. Um, sort of tickling at my the edges of my memory uh, about keto, but I I can't say for sure. But um, you know, the thing is that this is this is going to help in, in so many in so many ways. You know, there are a lot of different causes of a lot of different things, and and, and a lot of them are to do with eating the wrong wrong diet. Um, and then you can actually build up damage and you can, you can permanently damage things and parts of your body and, and your brain and nervous system included. And, you know, going back on an optimal diet can help things won't necessarily completely alleviate things. I'm glad that the DBS is helpful. That's, I, I literally put in two of those last week. So that's, uh, you sort of drill holes and sort of put these things in into a certain part of the brain and sort of give it a bit of, of stimulus to say, okay, yeah, that's, that's working. That's doing what we want to do. You can actually wake people up during the, the operation, say, okay, let me see your hand, do this, do this, do all these sorts of things. And, uh, and they're like, yeah, okay. You know, and now we sort of move it, change the frequency and all of a sudden they can't do it or they can do more or all these sorts of things. And so you get it right at the right place and at the right, um, you know, the right, uh, uh, you know, dosage. And, and that's great. I'm really happy that that, is helping him. Uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great surgery. You really help people. Um, I think carnivore is, is likely to help a lot as well. I, I can't say that it's going to help, uh, his essential tremor. I can say that it's going to help him in a thousand other ways and improve his health significantly. And I would, I would say based on what I can see, it would likely extend his healthy years of life and life in general. And so even if it doesn't help the essential tremor, which jury's out on, because I've seen so many neurological issues benefited so greatly by going on a carnivore diet. Perfect example is a guy um, who I've had on the podcast and I did a live with yesterday, uh, Dave, um, who has a, a channel 
on God, if you will find my live, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. I think it's like no carbs or something like that. But it's, uh, but anyway, he had a stroke 30 years ago and uh, when he was 19 and he had right-sided weakness ever since. And it was very difficult for him to walk around. He was, you know, limping, staggering, very difficult to go up and down stairs. He had to clutch onto the rail with his left hand because he didn't have the strength in his right hand. Uh, and he was very unbalanced. He was very worried about falling down the stairs every time he went up and down. Uh, two months on carnivore, his wife noticed. He's like, you're, you're walking differently. He's like, huh. And she videotaped him and he was just walking completely normal. And he, he said, now he can run up and down stairs. This is 30 years after he had a stroke. That's insane. Yeah. You know, you're not supposed, your brain's not supposed to recover. It's supposed to be, you know, it's thought that if you have damage that the axons can sort of, sort of tear and they sort of, they're just flapping loose. And from, you know, the side that your neuron is from that can start growing down more. And if they happen to catch and grow in, then they'll go back down the pipe and, and you'll get regain function. But if they go over here, it's gone forever. Right. And so you sort of see that you sort of see that in, you know, in six months, two years. And after two years, it's like, well, what you have is what you have, you know, 30 years later, this guy got his, his, his life back and his strength back and his mobility back and his coordination back. That is incredible. So, you know, I don't, I don't, discount anything i just say hey just take a look see if it works for you it uh, is doing a lot of really good things and it's going to improve your life in so many other ways anyway it's well worth uh trying uh regardless and hopefully it helps and if not dbs sounds like it's working great awesome i think we hit all the super chats that's great uh yeah, yeah. this has been great thank you so much dr chafee no, no, you're very welcome. Thank you for, for putting this on. I think it's great. And, and I, I, you know, I think it's really good to have, you know, things like this and people putting out those challenging questions, uh, because that's, that's what, those are the things that people are worried about and they're, they're coming to carnivore or they're, they're seeing people get good results like yourself. And they say like, okay, well, that sounds good, but like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want that at no, at, at, at any cost, you know, I don't want to be, you know, you know, like a deal with the devil where I have 10 good years and then I'm screwed and I die young and all these sorts of things. So, right. you know, that's not, that's not what, what people want. So it's, it's very important to address these things and, uh, you know, and, and it's important to, uh, you know, yeah, to discuss them in, in, in the open and have people be able to, to ask questions and challenging questions, you know, questions that, that are designed to, uh, to stump you. And, um, you know, and if, if they do, you know, oh gosh, I, you know, I don't know, Ooh, maybe we shouldn't do this, you know, maybe that, maybe that's the, that's a reason to, to think twice about it. Uh, but all of these things have answers, right. you know, and, um, they, you know, this, this really does work for people from what I can see, all the best evidence shows that humans are carnivores biologically and that our optimal diet, the thing is going to see us, give us the best health for all of us is what, from what I can see a high fat carnivore diet. And I've just seen absolutely miraculous things happen to people and, and diseases that, that people have just denied could ever be reversed are being reversed on mass now. And now it's funny. They're saying, no, that can't happen. That can't happen. That can't happen. Now they're saying, well, yeah, it can happen, but it's because you're getting rid of, you know, seed oil and you're going to die in 10 years. No, well, no, five minutes ago, you said it couldn't happen ever. And yet now I'm showing you 10,000 people where it happened in a published paper. Yeah, but no, 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 you, no, yeah, but like this, this just, this is just the right way to eat. You know, people are getting better, they're getting healthier. And, uh, and this is, this is what we've been designed to eat. We've been eating this way since time immemorial. And that is obviously what we're designed to eat. If that's what we've been eating this whole time, then that is what, you know, that's what we we're designed to eat. If we didn't start out being designed to eat it, we became designed to eat it through the process of evolution. That is how biology works. That is how the world works. That is how life works. And I'm sorry if you don't agree with that, but that is those are the facts. And that's how that's how this works. So I'm going to keep doing this. And I'm always happy to answer questions uh, as, as much as I have time to. And I uh, appreciate everyone coming on. And, and hopefully that answered a lot of questions and help people, um, you know, make up their mind about whether they want to give it a try themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. I was hoping maybe I could stump you on one, but you knocked them all out of the yeah. park, which I kind of figured would happen. But yeah, maybe we'll have to do another one of these sometime. This has been great. I think 
this would have really helped me when I started carnivore because it was there were several things I was worried about. I'm like, this is insane. I see these people doing well, but it's just nuts. But when you get over that fear and kind of the emotion and you see the facts and the truth, and there's so many things that you say, and then it's just like, oh yeah, okay, of course. Like that makes perfect sense. And it's like so much mm -hmm. clearer now. So yeah, I think this is really gonna help a lot of people out. And uh, I really thank you for your time. This has been great. Oh, you're very welcome. It was an absolute pleasure. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully everyone here enjoyed it. I think they did. Thanks a lot, Dr. Chafee. Everyone, thanks everyone for joining and uh, have a great day. Yeah, thanks everyone. See you next time.